Chain Fire, The Sword of Truth, Book 9, by Terry Goodkind. Read by Nick Sullivan. This book contains 667 pages. Of Chapter 1. How much of this blood is his? A woman asked. Most of it, I'm afraid, a second woman said, as they both rushed along beside him. As Richard fought to focus his mind on his need to remain conscious, the breathless voices sounded to him as if they were coming from some great dim distance. He wasn't sure who they were. He knew that he knew them, but right then it just didn't seem to matter. The crushing pain in the left side of his chest and his need for air had him at the ragged edge of panic. It was all he could do to try to draw each crucial breath. Even so, he had a bigger worry. Richard struggled to put voice to his burning concern, but he couldn't form the words, couldn't get out any more than a gasping moan. He clutched the arm of the woman beside him, desperate to get them to stop, to get them to listen. She misunderstood, and instead urged the men carrying him to hurry, even though they were already panting with the effort of bearing him over the rocky ground in the deep shade among the towering pines. They tried to be as gentle as possible, but they never dared to slow. Not far off, a rooster crowed into the still air as if this were an ordinary morning like any other. Richard observed the storm of activity swirling around him with an odd sense of detachment. Only the pain seemed real. He remembered hearing it once said that when you died, no matter how many people were there with you, you died all alone. That's how he felt now, alone. As they broke from the timber into a thinly wooded rough field of clumped grass, Richard saw above the leafy limbs a leaden sky threatening to unleash torrents of rain. Rain was the last thing he needed. If only it would hold off. As they raced along, the unpainted wooden walls of a small building came into view, followed by a twisting livestock fence weathered to a silver gray. Startled chickens squawked in fright as they scattered out of the way. Men shouted orders. Richard hardly noticed the ashen faces watching him being carried past as he stiffened himself against the dizzying pain of the rough journey. It felt as if he were being ripped apart. The whole mob around him funneled through a narrow doorway and shuffled into the darkness beyond. Here, the first woman said. Richard was surprised to realize then that it was Nietzsche's voice. Put him here, on the table. Hurry. Richard heard tin cups clatter as someone swept them aside. Small items thunked to the ground and bounced across a dirt floor. The shutters banged back as they were flung open to let some of the flat light into the musty room. It appeared to be a deserted farmhouse. The walls tilted at an odd angle as if the place were having difficulty standing, as if it might collapse at any moment. Without the people who had once made it home, given it life, it had the aura of a place waiting for death to settle in. Men holding his legs and arms lifted him and then carefully set him down on the crudely hewn plank table. Richard wanted to hold his breath against the crushing agony radiating from the left side of his chest, but he desperately needed the breath that he couldn't seem to get. He needed the breath in order to speak. Lightning flashed. A moment later, thunder rumbled heavily. Lucky we made it into shelter before the rain, one of the men said. Nietzsche nodded absently as she leaned close, groping purposefully across Richard's chest. He cried out, arching his back against the heavy wooden tabletop, trying to twist away from her probing fingers. The other woman immediately pressed his shoulders down to keep him in place. He tried to speak. He almost got the words out, but then he coughed up a mouthful of thick blood. He started choking as he tried to breathe. The woman holding his shoulders turned his head aside. Spit, she told him as she bent close. The feeling of not being able to get any air brought a flash of hot fear. Richard did as she said. She swept her fingers through his mouth, working to clear an airway. With her help, he finally managed to cough and spit out enough blood to be able to pull in some of the air he so desperately needed. As Nietzsche's fingers probed the area around the arrow jutting from the left side of his chest, 
She cursed under her breath. Dear spirits, she murmured in soft prayer as she tore open his blood-soaked shirt. Let me be in time. I was afraid to pull out the arrow, the other woman said. I didn't know what would happen, didn't know if I should, so I decided I'd better leave it and hope I could find you. Be thankful you didn't try, Nietzsche said, her hand slipping under Richard's back as he writhed in pain. If you'd pulled it out, he'd be dead by now. But you can heal him. It sounded more a plea than a question. Nietzsche didn't answer. You can heal him. That time, the words hissed out through gritted teeth. At the tone of command, born of frayed patience, Richard realized that it was Kara. He hadn't had time to tell her before the attack. Surely she would have to know. But if she knew, then why didn't she say? Why didn't she put him at ease? If it hadn't been for him, We'd have been taken by surprise, said a man standing off to the side. He saved us all when he waylaid those soldiers sneaking up on us. You have to help him, another man insisted. Nietzsche impatiently waved her arm. All of you, get out. This place is small enough as it is. I can't afford the distraction right now. I need some quiet. Lightning flashed again, as if the good spirits intended to deny her what she needed. Thunder boomed with a deep resonant threat of the storm closing around them. You'll send Kara out when you know something? One of the men asked. Yes, yes, go. And make sure there aren't any more soldiers around to surprise us, Kara added. Keep out of sight in case there are. We can't afford to be discovered here. Not right now. Men swore to do her bidding. Hazy light spilled across a dingy plastered wall when the door opened. As the men departed, their shadows ghosted through the patch of light like the good spirits themselves abandoning him. On his way by, one of the men briefly touched Richard's shoulder, an offer of comfort and courage. Richard vaguely recognized the face. He hadn't seen these men for quite a while. The thought occurred to him that this was no way to have a reunion. The light vanished as the men pulled the door closed behind themselves, leaving the room in the gloom of light coming from the single window. Nietzsche, Kara pressed in a low voice. You can heal him? Richard had been on his way to meet up with Nietzsche when troops sent to put down the uprising against the brutal rule of the Imperial Order had accidentally come upon his secluded camp. His first thought, just before the soldiers had blundered upon him, had been that he had to find Nietzsche. A spark of hope flared down into the darkness of his frantic worry. Nietzsche could help him. Now Richard needed to get her to listen. As she leaned close, her hand sliding around under him, apparently trying to see how close the arrow came to penetrating all the way through his back, Richard managed to clutch her black dress at the shoulder. He saw that his hand glistened with blood. He felt more running back across his face when he coughed. Her blue eyes turned to him. Everything will be all right, Richard. Lie still. A skein of blonde hair slipped forward over her other shoulder as he tried to pull her closer. I'm here. Calm down. I won't leave you. Lie still. It's all right. I'm going to help you. Despite how smoothly she covered it, panic lurked in her voice. Despite her reassuring smile, her eyes glistened with tears he knew then that his wound might very well be beyond her ability to heal. That only made it all the more important that he get her to listen. Richard opened his mouth trying to speak. He couldn't seem to get enough air. He shivered with cold, each breath a struggle that produced little more than a wet rattle. He couldn't die. Not here. Not now. Tears stung his eyes. Nietzsche gently pressed him back down. Lord Rall, Kara said, lie still, please. She took his hand from its hold on Nietzsche's dress and held it against herself in a tight grip. Nietzsche will take care of you. You'll be fine. Just lie still and let her do what she needs to do to heal you. Where Nietzsche's blonde hair was loose and flowing, Kara's was woven into a single braid. Despite how concerned he knew her to be, Richard could see in Kara's posture only her powerful presence, 
and in her features and her iron blue eyes, her strength of will. Right then, that strength, that self-assurance, was solid ground for him in the quicksand of terror. The arrow doesn't go all the way through, Nietzsche told Kara as she pulled her hand out from under his back. I told you so. He managed to at least deflect it with his sword. That's good, isn't it? It's better that it didn't pierce his back as well, isn't it? No, Nietzsche said under her breath. No? Kara leaned closer to Nietzsche. But how can it be worse that it didn't rip through his back as well? Nietzsche glanced up at Kara. It's a crossbow bolt. If it was sticking out his back, or close enough to need only to be pushed just a little more, we could break off the barbed head and pull the shaft back out. She left unsaid what they would now have to do. His bleeding isn't as bad, Kara offered. We've stopped that at least. Maybe on the outside. Nietzsche said in a confidential tone, but he is bleeding into his chest. Blood is filling his left lung. This time it was Kara who snatched a fistful of Nietzsche's dress. But you're going to do something. You're going to... Of course, Nietzsche growled as she pulled her shoulder free of Kara's grip. Richard gasped in pain. The rising waters of panic threatened to overwhelm him. Nietzsche laid her other hand on his chest to hold him still as well as to offer comfort. Kara, Nietzsche said, why don't you wait outside with the others? That isn't going to happen. You'd best just get on with it. Nietzsche appraised Kara's eyes briefly, then leaned in and again grasped the shaft jutting from Richard's chest. He felt the probing tingle of magic follow the course of the arrow down deep inside him, Richard recognized the unique feel of Nietzsche's power, much as he could recognize her singular silken voice. He knew that there was no time to delay in what he had to do. Once she started, there was no telling how long it would be until he woke, if he woke. With all his effort, Richard lunged, seizing her dress at the collar. He pulled himself close to her face, pulled her down toward him so she could hear him. He had to ask if they knew where Kalin was. If they didn't, then he had to ask Nietzsche to help him find her. The only thing he could get out was the single word. Kalin, he whispered with all his strength. All right, Richard, all right. Nietzsche gripped his wrists and pulled his hands off her dress. Listen to me. She pressed him back down against the table. Listen, there's no time. You have to calm down. Be still. Just relax and let me do the work. She brushed back his hair and laid a gentle, caring hand to his forehead as her other hand again grasped the cursed arrow. Richard desperately struggled to say no, struggled to tell them that they needed to find Kalen, but already the tingle of magic was intensifying into paralyzing pain. Richard went rigid with the agony of the power lancing into his chest. He could see Nietzsche and Kara's faces above him, and then a deadly darkness ignited within the room. He had been healed by Nietzsche before. Richard knew the feel of her power. This time something was different, dangerously different. Kara gasped. What are you doing? What I must if I'm to save him. It's the only way. But you can't... If you'd rather I let him slip into the arms of death than say so, otherwise let me do as I must to keep him among us. Kara studied Nietzsche's heated expression for only a moment before letting out a noisy breath and nodding. Richard reached for Nietzsche's wrist, but Kara caught his first and pressed it back to the table. His fingers came to rest on the woven gold wire spelling out the word truth on the hilt of his sword. He spoke Kalin's name again, but this time no sound would cross his lips. Kara frowned as she leaned toward Nietzsche. Did you hear what it was he said? I don't know, some name. Kalin, I think. Richard tried to say yes, but it came out as little more than a hoarse moan. Kalin? Kara asked. Who's Kalin? I have no idea. Nietzsche murmured as her concentration returned to the task at hand. 
He's obviously in delirium from loss of blood. Richard truly couldn't draw a breath against the pain that suddenly screamed through him. Lightning flashed and thunder pealed again, this time unleashing a torrent of rain that began to drum against the roof. Against his will, hazy darkness drew in around the faces. Richard managed only to whisper Kalin's name one last time before Nietzsche opened into him the full flood of magic. The world dissolved into nothingness. Chapter 2 The distant howl of a wolf woke Richard from a dead sleep. The forlorn cry echoed through the mountains but went unanswered. Richard lay on his side in the surreal light of false dawn, idly listening, waiting for a return cry that never came. Try as he might, he couldn't seem to open his eyes for longer than the span of a single slow heartbeat, much less gather the energy to lift his head. Shadowy tree limbs appeared to move about in the murky darkness. It was odd that such an ordinary sound as the distant howl of a wolf should wake him. He remembered that Kara had third watch. She would no doubt come to wake them soon enough. With great effort he summoned the strength to roll over. He needed to touch Kalin, to embrace her, to go back to sleep with her in his protective arms for a few more delicious minutes. His hand found only an expanse of empty ground. Kalin wasn't there. Where was she? Where had she gone off to? Perhaps she'd awakened early and gone to talk to Kara. Richard sat up. He instinctively checked to make sure that his sword was at hand. The reassuring feel of the polished scabbard and wire-wound hilt greeted his fingers. The sword lay on the ground beside him. Richard heard the soft whisper of a slow, steady rain. He remembered that for some reason he needed it not to rain. But if it was raining, then why didn't he feel it? Why was his face dry? Why was the ground dry? He sat up, rubbing his eyes, trying to get his bearings, trying to clear his foggy mind as he fought to herd together scattered thoughts. He peered into the darkness and realized that he wasn't outside. In the faint gray light of dawn coming in through a single small window, he saw that he was in a derelict room. The place smelled of wet wood and damp decay. Dying embers glowed deep within the ash in a hearth set into a plastered wall rising up before him. A blackened wooden spoon hung to one side of the hearth. A mostly bald broom leaned against the other side. But other than that, he saw no personal items to distinguish the people who lived there. Daybreak looked to be still some time off. The incessant patter of the rain against the roof promised that there would be no sun this chilly and damp day. Besides dripping through several holes in the tattered roof, rain leaked in around the chimney adding yet another layer of stain to the dingy plaster. Seeing the plastered wall, the hearth, and the heavy plank table brought back spectral fragments of memories. Driven by his need to know where Kalin was, Richard staggered to his feet, clutching at the lingering pain in the left side of his chest with one hand and the edge of the table with his other. At hearing him stand in the dimly lit room, Kara, leaning back in a chair not far away, shot to her feet. Lord Rall! He saw his sword lying on the table, but he had thought, Lord Rall, you're awake! In the somber light, Richard could see that Kara looked exuberant. He also saw that she was wearing her red leather. A wolf howled and woke me. Kara shook her head. I've been sitting right there awake, watching over you. No wolf howled. You must have dreamed it. Her smile returned. You look better. He recalled not being able to breathe, not being able to get enough air. He took an experimental deep breath and found that it came easily. While the ghost of terrible pain still haunted him, the reality of it had nearly faded away. Yes, I think I'm all right. 
Short, disjointed memories flashed in fits before his mind's eye. He remembered standing alone and still in the eerie early light as the dark tide of Imperial Order soldiers flooded through the trees. He remembered bits of their wild charge, their raised weapons. He remembered releasing himself into the fluid dance with death. He remembered, too, the hail of arrows and bolts from crossbows, and finally other men joining the battle. Richard lifted the front of his shirt out away from himself, looking down at it, not understanding why it was whole. Your shirt was ruined, Kara offered, noticing his puzzlement. We washed and shaved you, then we put a clean shirt on you. We. That one word rose up above all others in his mind. We. Kara and Kalin. That had to be what Kara meant. Where is she? Who? Kalin, he said, as he took a stride away from the support of the table. Where is she? Kalin? Kara's features meandered into a provocative smile. Who's Kalin? Richard sighed with relief. Kara would not be needling him in such a way if Kalin were hurt or in any kind of trouble. That much he knew for certain. An overwhelming sense of relief purged his dread and with it some of his weariness. Kalin was safe. He couldn't help being cheered, too, by Kara's impish expression. He loved to see her with a light-hearted smile, in part because it was such a rare sight. Usually, when a moored Sith smiled, it was a menacing prelude to something wholly unpleasant. The same was true when they wore their red leather. Kalin, Richard said, playing along, you know, my wife, where is she? Kara's nose wrinkled with seldom-seen feminine mirth. Such an extraordinary look was so uncommon on Kara that it not only surprised him, but spurred him into a grin. A wife, she drawled, turning coy. Now there's a novel concept, the Lord Rall taking a wife. That he found himself to be the Lord Rall, the leader of Dahara, at times still seemed unreal to him. It was not the kind of thing a woods guide growing up in far-off Westland would ever have dreamed up in his wildest imaginings. Yes, well, one of us had to be the first. He wiped a hand across his face, still trying to clear the web of sleep from his mind. Where is she? Kara's smile widened. Kaylin, she tilted her head toward him, arching one brow. Your wife. Yes, Kaylin, my wife, Richard said offhandedly. He had long ago learned that it was best not to give Kara the satisfaction of seeing her mischievous antics get to him. You remember her, intelligent, green eyes, tall, long hair, and, of course, the most beautiful woman I've ever laid eyes on. The leather of Kara's outfit creaked as she straightened her back and folded her arms. You mean the most beautiful besides me, of course. Her eyes were luminous when she smiled. He didn't rise to the bait. Well, Kara finally said with a sigh, the Lord Rall certainly seems to have had an interesting dream during his long sleep. Long sleep? You've been asleep for two days after Nietzsche healed you. Richard raked his fingers back through his dirty, matted hair. Two days, he said as he tried to reconcile his fragmented memories. He was becoming annoyed with Kara's game. So where is she? Your wife? Yes, my wife. Richard planted his fists on his hips as he leaned toward the irksome woman. You know, the mother confessor. Mother confessor? My, my, Lord Rall, but when you dream, you certainly do dream big. Smart, beautiful, and the mother confessor as well. Kara leaned in with a taunting look. And no doubt she's also madly in love with you. Kara. Oh, wait. She held up a hand to stop him as she abruptly turned serious. Nietzsche said that she wanted me to go get her if you woke. She was really insistent about it. Said that if you woke, she needed to have a look at you. Kara started toward the single closed door at the back of the room. She's only been asleep for a couple of hours, but she'll want to know that you're awake. 
Kara was in the back room for no more than a moment when Nietzsche burst out of the darkness, pausing briefly to grasp the doorframe. Richard! Before Richard could say anything, Nietzsche, her eyes wide with relief at seeing him alive, dashed to him and seized his shoulders as if she thought he were a good spirit come to the world of the living and only her firm grip would keep him there. I was so worried. How are you feeling? She looked as drained as he felt. Her mane of blonde hair hadn't been brushed out, and it looked like she'd been sleeping in her black dress. Even so, the contrast of her disheveled appearance only served to highlight her exquisite beauty. Well, all right for the most part, except that I feel exhausted and lightheaded, despite having had what Kara tells me was quite a long sleep. Nietzsche dismissively waved a slender hand. That's to be expected. With rest, you will have your full strength back soon enough. You lost a lot of blood. It will take time for your body to recover. Nietzsche, I need hush, she said, as she put one hand behind his back and pressed the flat of her other to his chest. Her smooth brow drew together in concentration. Though she appeared to be about his age, or at most only a year or two older, she had lived a very long time as a sister of the light at the Palace of the Prophets, where those within the walls aged differently. Nietzsche's graceful manner, the keen appraisal of her blue eyes, and her singular subdued smile, always delivered with her knowing gaze locked on his, had been at first distracting and then unsettling, but was now merely familiar. Richard winced as he felt Nietzsche's power tingling deep into his chest between her hands. It was a disconcerting penetration. It made his heart flutter. A mild wave of nausea coursed through him. It's holding, Nietzsche murmured to herself. She looked up into his eyes then. The vessels are whole and strong. The look of wonder in her eyes betrayed how uncertain she had been of success. Some of her reassuring smile returned. You still need to rest, but you're doing well, Richard. You really are. He nodded, relieved to hear that he was healthy, even if she sounded a little surprised by it. But his other concerns needed to be put to rest as well. Nietzsche, where's Kalin? Kara's in one of her moods this morning and won't say. Nietzsche looked to be at a loss. Who? Richard took hold of her wrist and removed her hand from his chest. What's wrong? Is she hurt? Where is she? Kara tilted her head toward Nietzsche. While he slipped, Lord Rall dreamed himself up a wife. Nietzsche turned an astonished frown on Kara. A wife? Remember the name he called out when he was delirious? Kara flashed a conspiratorial smile. That's the one he married in his dream. She's beautiful and smart, of course. Beautiful. Nietzsche blinked at the woman. And smart. Kara cocked an eyebrow. And she's the mother confessor. Nietzsche looked incredulous. The mother confessor? Enough, Richard said as he released Nietzsche's wrist. I mean it now. Where is she? It was immediately apparent to both women that his indulgent sense of humor had evaporated. The intensity in his voice, to say nothing of his glare, gave them pause. Richard, Nietzsche said in a cautious tone, you were hurt pretty bad. For a time, I didn't think. She hooked a stray strand of hair behind her ear and started over. Look, when a person is hurt as seriously as you were, it can play tricks with their mind. It's only natural. I've seen it before. When you were shot with that arrow, you couldn't breathe. Not getting air, like when you're drowning, causes... What's the matter with you two? What's going on? Richard couldn't understand why they were stalling. His heart felt as if it were galloping out of control. Is she hurt? Tell me! Richard, Nietzsche said in a calm voice, obviously meant to settle him down. The bolt from that crossbow came perilously close to going right through your heart. If it had, there wouldn't have been anything I could have done. I can't raise the dead. Even though it missed your heart, the arrow still did serious damage. People just don't survive a wound as grave as you had. 
I wouldn't have been able to heal you in the conventional manner because it couldn't be done. There was no time to even try to get the arrow out in any other way. You were bleeding inside. I had to... She faltered as she stared up into his eyes. Richard bent down a little toward her. You had to what? Nietzsche shrugged one shoulder self-consciously. I had to use subtractive magic. Nietzsche was a powerful sorceress in her own right, but she was infinitely more exceptional in that she was able to wield underworld forces as well. She had once been committed to those forces. She had once been known as Death's Mistress. Healing was not exactly her specialty. Richard's caution flared. Why? To get the arrow out of you. You eliminated the arrow with subtractive magic? There was no time and no other way. She again clasped his shoulders, although more compassionately this time. If I hadn't done something, you would have been dead in mere moments. I had to. Richard glanced to Kara's grim expression and then back to Nietzsche. Well, I guess that makes sense. At least it sounded like it made sense. He didn't really know if it did or not. Having been raised in the vast woods of Westland, Richard didn't know a great deal about magic. And some of your blood, Nietzsche added in a low voice. He didn't like the sound of that. What? You were bleeding into your chest. One lung had already failed. I was able to perceive that your heart was being forced out of place. The major arteries were in danger of being ripped apart from the pressure. I needed the blood out of the way in order to heal you, so that your lungs and heart could work properly. They were failing. You were in a state of shock and delirium. You were near death. Nietzsche's blue eyes brimmed with tears. I was so afraid, Richard. There was no one but me to help you, and I was so afraid that I would fail. Even after I did everything I could to heal you, I still wasn't sure you would ever wake again. Richard could see the toll of that fear in her expression and feel it in the way her fingers trembled on his arms. It spoke to how far she had come since she had given up her belief in the cause of the Sisters of the Dark and then the Imperial Order. The haunted look on Kara's face confirmed for him the truth of how desperate the situation had been. For all the sleep he'd apparently gotten, neither of them appeared to have had much more than brief naps. It must have been a frightening vigil. The rain drummed without let-up against the roof. Other than that, the dank husk of a house was dead quiet. Life seemed all the more fleeting in the abandoned home. The forsaken place gave Richard the chills. You saved my life, Nietzsche. I remember being afraid I was going to die, but you saved my life. He touched his fingertips to her cheek. Thank you. I wish there was a better way to say it, a better way to tell you how much I appreciate what you did, but I can't think of any. Nietzsche's small smile and simple nod told him that she grasped the depth of his sincerity. Another thought struck him. Do you mean to say that using subtractive magic caused some kind of problem? No, no, Richard. Nietzsche squeezed his arms as if to allay his fears. No, I don't think that it caused any harm. What do you mean you don't think it did? She hesitated a moment before explaining. I've never done anything like that before. I've never even heard of it being done. Dear spirits, I didn't even know that it could be done. As I'm sure you can imagine, using subtractive magic in such a way is risky, to put it mildly. Anything living touched by it would also be destroyed. I had to use the core of the arrow itself as a pathway into you. I was as careful as I could possibly be that I only eliminated the arrow and the spent blood. Richard wondered what happened to things when subtractive magic was used, what would have happened to his blood, but his head was already spinning with the story, and he most wanted her to get to the point. But between all that, Nietzsche added, between the massive loss of blood, the injury, the dire condition of not being able to get enough air, the stress you underwent while I used regular additive magic to heal you, 
to say nothing of the unknown element that subtractive magic added into the mix, you were going through an experience that can only be described as unpredictable. Such a terrible crisis can cause unexpected things to happen. Richard didn't know what she was getting at. What unexpected things? There's no telling. I had no choice but to use extreme methods. You were beyond what I thought were all limits. You have to try to understand that you were not yourself there for a while. Kara hooked a thumb behind her red leather belt. Nietzsche is right, Lord Ral. You weren't yourself. You were fighting us. I had to hold you down just so she could help you. I've stood over the men at the cusp of death. Strange things happen when they're in that place. Believe me, you were there a long time into that first night. Richard knew very well what she meant when she said that she had stood over men on the cusp of death. The profession of Mord Sith had been torture. At least it had been until he changed all that. He carried the Ajeel of Denna, the Mord Sith who had once stood over him in that capacity. She had given him her Aegeal as a solemn gift in gratitude for freeing her from the madness of her terrible duty, even though she had known that the price of that freedom was to be his sword through her heart. Right then, Richard felt a very long way from the peaceful woods where he'd grown up. Nietzsche spread her hands as if imploring him to try harder to understand. You were unconscious and then asleep for quite a while, I had to revive you enough to get you to drink water and a broth, but I needed you to stay in a deep sleep so that you could begin to recover your strength. I had to use a spell to keep you in that state. You'd lost a lot of blood. Had I allowed you to awake too soon, it would have sapped your tenuous strength, and you still could have slipped away from us. Died, that was what she meant. He could have died. Richard took a deep breath. He'd had no idea of everything that had gone on over the last three days. He basically recalled the battle and then waking when he heard the wolf howl. Nietzsche, he said, trying to show her that he could be calm and understanding even though he felt neither. What does this have to do with Kalin? Her features were set in an uneasy mix of empathy and disquiet. Richard, this woman, Kalin, is just a product of your mind when you were in that confused state of shock and delirium before I could heal you. Nietzsche, I wasn't imagining. You were at the brink of death, she said, as she held up a hand, commanding silence and for him to listen. In your mind, you were grasping for someone to help you, someone like this person, Kalen. Please believe me when I say that it's understandable, but you're awake now and must face the truth. She was figment born of your dire condition. Richard was dumbfounded to hear her even suggesting such a thing. He turned to Kara, imploring her to come to her senses, if not his rescue. How could you possibly think such a thing? How could you believe it? Haven't you ever had a dream where you were terrified, then your long dead mother was there alive and she was going to help you? Kara's unblinking blue eyes seemed focused elsewhere. Don't you remember waking after such dreams and feeling sure that it had been real, that your mother was alive again, really alive, and that she was going to help you? Don't you remember how much you wanted to cling to that feeling? Don't you remember how desperately you wanted it to be real? Nietzsche lightly touched the place where the arrow had been, where his flesh was now whole. After I'd healed you to the point that you were past the worst of the crisis, you went into a long, dreaming state of sleep. You carried these desperate illusions forward with you. You dreamed about them, added to them, lived with them longer than any ordinary sleep. This prolonged dream, this comforting illusion, this divine longing had time to seep into every corner of your thoughts, saturate every part of your mind, and became real to you just as Kara says. But because of the length of time you were asleep, it gained even more power. Now that you've only just come awake from that protracted sleep, you are merely having a little trouble filtering out what part of your ordeal was a dream and what was real. Nietzsche is right, Lord Rall, 
Richard couldn't remember Kara ever looking so dead serious. You just dreamed it. Like you dreamed that you heard a wolf howl. It sounds like a nice dream. This woman you dreamed you married. But that's all it is. A dream. Richard's mind reeled. The concept of Kalin being nothing more than a dream, a figment of his imagination born in his delirium, was at its core terrifying. That terror stormed unchecked through him. If what they were saying was true, then he didn't want to be awake. If it was true, then he wished that Nietzsche had never healed him. He didn't want to live in a world where Kalin wasn't real. He groped for solid ground in a sea of dark disorder, too stunned to think of a way to fight such a shapeless threat. He felt confused by his ordeal and that he didn't remember much of it. His certainty in what he regarded as truth began to crumble. He caught himself. He knew better than to believe a fear and thus give it life while he could not fathom how they'd latched on to such a monstrous idea, he knew that Kalin wasn't a dream. After all that you've both shared with her, how can you two possibly say that Kalin is just a dream? How indeed, Nietzsche asked, if what you're saying were true? Lord Rall, we would never be so cruel as to try to deceive you about something so important to you. Richard blinked at them. Could it be? He frantically tried to imagine if there was any possibility that what they were saying could be true. His fists tightened. Stop it, both of you. It was a plea for a return of sanity. He hadn't meant for it to come out as threatening, but it did. Nietzsche took half a step back. Kara's face lost a little of its color. Richard couldn't slow his breathing, his racing heart. I don't remember my dreams. He looked at each of them in turn. Not since I was little. I don't remember any dreams while I was hurt or while I slept. None. Dreams are meaningless. Kalen is not. Don't do this to me, please. This isn't helping anything. It's only making it worse. Please, if something has happened to Kalen, I need to know. That had to be it. Something had happened to her, and they just didn't think he was strong enough yet to handle the news. A worse fear by far welled up when he recalled Nietzsche saying that she couldn't raise the dead. Could they be trying to shield him from that? He gritted his teeth with the effort not to scream at them, to keep his voice level and in control. Where is Kalen? Nietzsche cautiously dipped her head as if beseeching his forgiveness. Richard, she is just in your mind. I know that such things can seem very real, but it's not. You dreamed her up while you were hurt, nothing more. I did not dream up Kalen. He again turned his plea to the moored Sith. Kara, you've been with us for more than two years. You have fought with us, fought for us. Back when Nietzsche was a sister of the dark and she brought me down here to the old world, you stood in for me and protected Kalen. She has protected you. You've shared and endured things that most people could never even imagine. You've become friends. He gestured to her Aegeal, the weapon that looked like nothing more than a short, thin red leather rod hanging by a thin gold chain from her right wrist. You even named Kalen a sister of the Aegeal. Kara stood stiff and mute. Kara's conferring on Kalen the title of a sister of the Aegeal had been an informal but deeply solemn accolade from a former mortal enemy to a woman she had come to respect and trust. Kara, you may have started out as a protector to the Lord Rall, but you've become more than that to Kalen and me. You've become like family. Kara would willingly and without hesitation sacrifice her life to protect Richard. She was not only ruthless, but fearless in her defense of him. The one thing Kara did fear was disappointing him. That fear was clearly evident in her eyes. Thank you, Lord Rall, she finally said in a meek voice, for including me in your wonderful dream. 
Richard's flesh prickled as a wave of cold dread washed up through him. Overwhelmed, he pressed his hand to his forehead, pushing back his hair. These two women were not inventing some story for fear of telling him bad news. They were telling him the truth. The truth as they saw it, anyway. The truth somehow twisted into a nightmare. He couldn't make any of it work in his mind, couldn't make any sense of it. After all they had shared with Kalin, all they had been through with her, all their time together, it was impossible for him to understand how these two women could be saying this to him. And yet they were. Although he couldn't conceive of the cause, something was obviously and dreadfully wrong. A suffocating sense of foreboding settled over him. It felt as if the whole world had been turned upside down, and now he couldn't make the pieces fit back together. He had to do something. What he had been about to do just before the soldiers had attacked them. Maybe it wasn't too late. Chapter 3 Richard knelt beside his bedroll and started jamming clothes into his pack. The cold drizzle he could see through the small window didn't look like it would be ending any time soon, so he left his cloak out. What do you think you're doing? Nietzsche asked. He spotted a cake of soap lying nearby and snatched it up. What does it look like I'm doing? He had already lost far too much time. He'd lost days. There was no time to waste. He shoved the cake of soap, packets of dried herbs and spices, and a pouch of dried apricots down into the pack before quickly furling his bedroll. Kara abandoned questioning or objecting, and instead set about packing her own things. That's not what I mean, and you know it. Nietzsche squatted down beside him and took hold of his arm, pulling him around to look at her. Richard, you can't leave. You need to rest. I told you, you lost a lot of blood. You aren't strong enough yet to go running off chasing phantoms. He stifled an indignant reply and yanked tight a leather thong around his bedroll. I feel fine. He didn't, of course, but he felt good enough. Nietzsche had just spent days of intense effort saving his life. Besides being worried for him, she was exhausted and probably wasn't thinking clearly. All of those things likely contributed to her believing he was acting irresponsibly. Still, he bristled that she didn't give him more credit. Nietzsche insistently gripped a fistful of his shirt as he cinched the second thong tight. You don't yet realize how weak you really are, Richard. You're jeopardizing your life. You need to rest in order for your body to be able to recover. You haven't had nearly enough time to build your strength. And how much time does Kalen have? He seized Nietzsche's upper arm and in heated frustration pulled her close. She's out there, somewhere, in trouble. You don't realize it, Kara doesn't realize it, but I do. Do you think I can just lie around here when the person I love more than anything in the world is in peril? If it were you in trouble, Nietzsche, would you wish me to so easily give up on you? Wouldn't you want me to try? I don't know what's gone wrong, but something has. If I'm right, and I am, then I can't even begin to guess at the implications or imagine the consequences. What do you mean? Well, if you're right, then I'm just imagining things out of my dreams. But if I'm right, and since it's pretty obvious that you and Kara can't both be sharing the same mental disorder, that would have to mean that whatever is happening has a cause that isn't benevolent. I can't afford to delay and risk everything while I try to convince you of the seriousness of the situation. Too much time has already been lost. Too much is at stake. Nietzsche looked too startled by the notion to speak. Richard released her and turned back to fasten down the flap on his pack. He didn't have the time to try to solve the puzzle of whatever was going on with Nietzsche and Kara. Nietzsche finally found her voice. Richard, don't you see what you're doing? You're beginning to invent absurd notions in order to justify what you want to believe. You said it yourself. Kara and I can't both be sharing the same disorder of the mind. Stay and rest. We can try to discover the nature of this dream that has taken such strong root in your mind and hopefully set it right. 
I probably caused it with something I did when I was trying to heal you. If so, I'm sorry. Please, Richard, stay for now. She was focused only on what she saw as the problem. Zed, his grandfather, the man who had helped raise him, had often said as Richard was growing up, don't think of the problem, think of the solution. The solution he needed to concentrate on now was how to find Kaelin before it was too late. He wished he had Zed's help to find the solution to where she was. You aren't out of serious danger yet, Nietzsche insisted as she dodged drips of rainwater trickling through holes in the roof. Pushing yourself too hard could be fatal. I understand. I really do. Richard checked the knife he wore at his belt and then slipped it back into its sheath. I don't intend to ignore your advice. I'll take it as easy as I can. Richard, listen to me, Nietzsche said, rubbing her fingers against her temple as if her head was aching. It's more than that alone. She paused to run her hand back over her hair as she searched for the words. You aren't invincible. You may carry that sword, but it can't always protect you. Your ancestors, every Lord Raal before you, despite their mastery of the gift, still kept bodyguards close at hand. You may have been born with the gift, but even if you were competent in its use, such power is no assurance of protection, especially not now. That arrow only served to show how vulnerable you really are. You may be an important man, Richard, but you are just a man. We all need you. We all so desperately need you. Richard looked away from the anguish in Nietzsche's blue eyes. He knew very well how vulnerable he was. Life was his highest value. He didn't take it for granted. He almost never objected to Kara being close at hand. She and the rest of the moored Sith, as well as other bodyguards he seemed to have inherited, had proven their worth more than once. But that didn't mean that he was helpless, or that he could allow caution to prevent him from doing what was necessary. More than that, though, he grasped Nietzsche's larger meaning. He had learned, while at the Palace of the Prophets, that the Sisters of the Light believed that he was deeply enmeshed in ancient prophecy, that he was a central figure around whom events revolved. According to the Sisters, if their side was to prevail over the dark forces arrayed against them, it would only be if Richard led them to victory. Prophecy said that without him all would be lost. Their prelate, Annalena, had spent a great deal of her life manipulating events to make sure that he survived to grow up and lead them in this war. Anne's hopes for everything they held dear, to hear her tell it, rested on his shoulders. At least Kalin had thankfully taken the fire out of Anne in that regard. He knew, though, that many others still held the same view. He knew, too, that his leadership had galvanized a great many people who longed to simply live free. Richard had been down in the vaults at the Palace of the Prophets and had seen some of the most important and well-guarded books of prophecy in existence. He had to admit that some of it was pretty uncanny. Nevertheless, his experience had been that prophecy seemed to say whatever it was people wanted it to say. He had personal experience with prophecy involving Kalin and himself, especially those prophecies of Shota, the witch woman. As far as he was concerned, prophecy had proven itself to be of little value and great trouble. Richard forced a smile. Nietzsche, you're sounding like a sister of the light. She didn't look to be amused. Kara will be with me, he said, trying to ease her mind. He realized, after he'd said it, that having Kara with him hadn't stopped the arrow that had taken him down. Come to think of it, where had she been during the battle? He didn't remember her being there with him. Kara didn't fear a fight. A team of horses couldn't drag her away from protecting him. Surely she must have been close beside him, but he just didn't recall seeing her. He picked up his big leather overbelt and fastened it around his waist. He had gotten the belt and other parts of the outfit, which had once belonged to a great wizard, from the wizard's keep, where Zed now stood guard, 
protecting the keep from Emperor Jagang and his horde from the old world. Nietzsche heaved an impatient sigh, a glimpse of a stern and implacable side of her that Richard knew all too well. He knew, though, that this time it was powered by sincere concern for his well-being. Richard, we simply can't afford this distraction. There are important things we need to talk about. That's why I was coming to you in the first place. Didn't you get the letter I sent? Richard paused. Letter, letter. Yes, he said, at last remembering. I did get your letter. I sent word to you with a soldier Kaylin had touched with her power. Richard caught Kara's brief glance up at Nietzsche, a surprised look that said she didn't recall any such thing. Nietzsche appraised him with an unreadable look. The word you sent never found me. Somewhat surprised, Richard gestured toward the New World. His primary mission was to go north and assassinate Emperor Jagang. He was touched by a confessor's power. He would die before ever abandoning her command. If he couldn't find you, he would have gone after Jagang. I suppose it's also possible that something happened to him first. There are perils enough in the old world. The look on Nietzsche's face made him feel like he had just offered her further evidence that he was losing his mind. Do you honestly think, even in your wildest imaginings, that the Dreamwalker can be so easily eliminated? No, of course not. He pushed the bulge of a cooking pot in his pack back into place. We expected that the soldier would probably be killed in the attempt. We sent him after Jagang because he was a murdering thug and deserved to die but I also thought that there was a possibility that he might succeed. Even if he didn't, I wanted Jagang to at least lose some sleep knowing that any of his men could be assassins. He could see by Nietzsche's too calm expression that she thought that this, too, was no more than part of his elaborate delusion about a woman he had dreamed. Richard recalled then what else had happened. Nietzsche, I'm afraid that shortly after Sabar delivered your letter, we were attacked. He died in that fight. A furtive glance to Kara brought a nod in confirmation. Dear spirits, Nietzsche said in sorrow at hearing the news about young Sabar. Richard shared her sentiment. He remembered Nietzsche's urgent warning in the letter about how Jagang had started to create weapons out of gifted people, as had been done 3,000 years before in the Great War. It was a frightening development that had been thought impossible but Jagang had discovered a way to accomplish the task by using the Sisters of the Dark he held captive. During the attack on their camp, Nietzsche's letter had been knocked into the fire. Richard hadn't had the chance to read the whole letter before it had been destroyed. He'd read enough, though, to understand the danger. When he made for the table where his sword lay, Nietzsche stepped in front of him. Richard, I know it's hard, but you have to put this dream business behind you. We don't have time for it. We need to talk. If you got my letter, then at least you know that you can't... Nietzsche, Richard said, silencing her. I must do this. He laid a hand on her shoulder and spoke as patiently as he could, considering his sense of urgency, but by his tone let her know that he was not going to discuss it further. If you come with us, then we can talk later, when there is time and it doesn't interfere with what I need to do. But right now I don't have the time, and neither does Kalin. Pressing the back of his hand against the side of her shoulder, Richard moved her aside and strode to the table. As he lifted his sword by its polished scabbard, he briefly wondered why, when he had heard the wolf howl and he woke up, he'd thought the sword had been lying on the ground beside him. Maybe he had remembered a fragment of a dream. Impatient to get going, he dismissed it. He slipped the ancient tooled leather baldric over his head and quickly adjusted the scabbard at his left hip, making sure it was securely fastened. With two fingers, he lifted the sword by the downswept cross guard, not only to be sure that it was clear in its sheath, but to check that the blade was sound. He couldn't remember everything that had happened in the fight, and he didn't recall putting the sword away himself. The polished steel gleamed through a film of dried blood. Fragmented memories of the battle flashed through his mind. 
It had been sudden and unexpected, but once he had pulled the sword free in anger, unexpected no longer mattered. Being so heavily outnumbered, though, had mattered. He understood all too well that Nietzsche was right about him not being invincible. Not long after he'd met Kalin, Zed, in his capacity as first wizard, had named Richard to the post of Seeker and had given him the sword. Richard had hated the weapon because of what he mistakenly thought it represented. Zed told him that the Sword of Truth, as it was named, was but a tool, and that it was the intent of the individual wielding a sword that gave it meaning. That had never been so true as it was with this particular weapon. The sword was now bonded to Richard, bonded to his intent, driven by his purpose. From the beginning, his intent and purpose had been to protect those he loved and cared about. To do that, he had come to realize that he had to help shape a world in which they could live in safety and peace. It was that intent that gave the sword meaning for him. The steel hissed as he slid it back into its scabbard. His intent now was to find Kalin. If the sword could help him accomplish that goal, and he would not hesitate to put it to use. He hoisted his pack and swung it around, settling it onto its familiar place on his back as he scanned the nearly barren room for any of his things he might have missed. On the floor beside the hearth, he saw dried meat and travel biscuits. Beside them lay other bundled foodstuffs. Richard's and Kara's simple wooden bowls were there as well, one with broth and the other holding the remnants of porridge. Kara, he said, as he swept up three water skins and hung their straps around his neck. Be sure to get all the food that can travel and bring it along. Don't forget the bowls. Kara nodded. She packed methodically now that she realized he had no intention of leaving her behind. Nietzsche caught his sleeve. Richard, I mean it. We have to talk. It's important. Then do as I ask. Get your things and come with me. He snatched up his bow and quiver. You can talk all you want as long as you don't hold me up. With a nod of resignation, Nietzsche finally abandoned her arguments and rushed to the back room to gather her own things. Far from minding having Nietzsche along, Richard wanted her help. Her gift might be useful in finding Kalin. In fact, finding Nietzsche so she could help him had been his intention when he first awoke before the attack and realized that Kalin was missing. Richard threw his hooded forest cloak around his shoulders and headed for the door. Kara looked up from beside the hearth where she hurried to finish collecting her gear and gave him a nod to let him know she'd be right behind him. He could see Nietzsche in the back room, rushing to get her things before he got far. In his urgent need to find Kalin, Richard's imagination was beginning to get the better of him. He could see her hurt, see her in pain, the thought of Kalin somewhere alone and in trouble made his heart quicken with dread. Against his will, the crushing memory of the time she had been beaten nearly to death flooded forth. He had given up everything else and had taken her far away back into the mountains where no one could find them so that she would be safe and could have time to heal. That summer, after she had started to recover her strength and before Nietzsche had shown up to capture him and take him away, had been one of the best summers of his life. How Kara could forget that special time was incomprehensible to him. From force of habit, he lifted his sword to make sure it was clear in its scabbard before he threw open the simple plank door. Damp air and iron-gray morning light greeted him. Water collected by the roof dripped from the eaves, splashing back against his boots. Cold drizzle prickled against his face. At least it was no longer pouring rain. Clouds hung low and thick, hiding the tops of oaks walling off the far side of the small pasture, where trailers of mist drifted like phantoms above the glistening grass. Massive gnarled trunks sheltered dark shadows. Richard was angry and frustrated, that it had to rain now of all times. If it hadn't rained, his chances would have been far better. Still, it would not be impossible. There were always signs. There would still be tracks. The rain would make it harder to read them,
But even this much rain would not erase all trace of the tracks. Richard had grown up tracking animals and people through the woods. He could follow tracks in the rain. It was more difficult and more time consuming, and it required intense concentration, but he could certainly do it. And then it hit him. When he found Kalin's tracks, then he would have proof that she was real. Nietzsche and Kara would at last have no choice but to believe him. Everyone left unique tracks. He knew Kalin's. He also knew the route they'd come in by. Along with his and Kara's tracks, Kalin's tracks would also be there for all to see. A sense of hope, if not relief, surged up through him. Once he found a set of readable prints and showed them to Nietzsche and Kara, there would be no more arguing. They would realize that it wasn't a dream and that there really was something seriously wrong. Then he could start following Kalin's tracks out of their camp and find her. The rain would slow that effort, but it wouldn't stop him, and there might be a way for Nietzsche's ability to help speed that search. Men milling about outside saw him stepping out of the small house and rushed in from all around. These men were not soldiers in the strict sense. They were wagon drivers, millers, carpenters, stonemasons, farmers, and merchants who had struggled their whole life under the repressive rule of the order, trying to eke out a living and support their families. For most of these working people, life in the old world meant living in constant fear. Anyone who dared to speak out against the ways of the order was swiftly arrested, charged with sedition, and executed. There was a steady stream of charges and arrests, whether true or not. Such swift justice kept people in fear and in line. Continual indoctrination, especially of the young, produced a significant segment of the population who fanatically believed in the ways of the order. From birth, children were taught that thinking for themselves was wrong and that fervent faith in selfless sacrifice for the greater good was the only means to an afterlife of glory in the Creator's light and the only way to avoid an eternity in the dark depths of the underworld in the merciless hands of the keeper. Any other way of thinking was evil. The properly devout were only too eager to see things remain as they were. The promise of riches to be shared with the common people kept the ever pious supporters of the order perpetually waiting for their quota of the blood of others, waiting to share in the loot of the wicked, who they were taught were their selfish oppressors and therefore sinners who deserved their fate. From the ranks of the righteous came a flood of young men volunteering into the army, eager to be part of the noble struggle to crush the non-believers, to punish the wicked, to confiscate ill-gotten gains, the sanction of the plunder, the free reign of brutality, and the widespread rape of the unconverted bred a particularly vicious and virulent kind of zealotry it had spawned an army of savages. Such was the nature of the Imperial Order soldiers who had poured into the New World and now rampaged nearly unchecked across Richard and Kalin's homeland. The world stood at the brink of a very dark age. It was this very threat that Anne believed Richard had been born to fight. She and many others believed it was foretold that if free people were to have a chance to survive this great battle, it would only be if Richard led them. These men before him saw through the empty ideas and corrupt promises of the order, saw it for what it was, tyranny. They had decided to take back their lives. That made them warriors in the struggle for freedom. A surprised upwelling of shouted greetings and cries of delight broke the early morning stillness. As they gathered in close, the men all talked at once, asking if he was well and how he felt. Their sincere concern touched him. Despite his sense of urgency, Richard forced himself to smile and clasp arms with men he knew from the city of Alturang. This was more the kind of reunion they had been hoping for. Besides having worked beside many of these men and having become acquainted with others, Richard knew that he was also a symbol of liberty to them, the Lord Rall from the New World, the Lord Rall from a land where men were free. He had shown them that such things were possible for them too, 
and given them a vision of the way their lives could be. To his own mind, Richard saw himself as the same woods guide he had always been, even if he had been named the Seeker and now led the Daharan Empire. While he had gone through many trying times since leaving home, he was really the same person with the same beliefs. Where he had once stood up to bullies, he now had to face armies. While the scale was different, the principles were the same. But right then, all he cared about was finding Kalen. Without her, the rest of the world, life itself, didn't seem very important to him. Not far off, leaning against a post, stood a brawny man wearing not a smile, but a menacing glare that had set permanent creases in his brow. The man folded his powerful arms across his chest as he watched the rest of the men greeting Richard. Richard hurried through the crowd of men, clasping hands as he went toward the scowling blacksmith. Victor! The scowl gave way to a helpless grin. The man gripped arms with Richard. Nietzsche and Kara would only let me go in to see you twice. If they didn't let me see you this morning, I was going to wrap iron bars around their necks. Was that you, the first morning? You passed me on your way out and touched my shoulder? Victor grinned as he nodded. It was. I helped carry you back here. He put a powerful hand on Richard's shoulder and gave him an experimental shake. You look well mended, even if a little pale. I have lardo. It will give you strength. I'm fine, maybe later. Thanks for helping bring me in here. Listen, Victor, have you seen Kalen? Victor's brow bunched back up with deep creases. Kalen? My wife. Victor stared without reaction. His hair was cropped so close that his head almost appeared shaved. The rain beaded on his scalp. One brow arched. Richard... Since you have been gone, you took a wife? Richard anxiously looked over his shoulder to the other men watching him. Have any of you seen Kalen? He was greeted with blank expressions from many. Others shared a puzzled look with one another. The gray morning had fallen silent. They didn't know who he was talking about. Many of these men knew Kalen and should have remembered her. Now they were shaking their heads or shrugging their regrets. Richard's mood sank. The problem was worse than he thought. He had thought that maybe it was only something that had happened to Nietzsche and Kara's memory. He turned back to the master blacksmith's frown. Victor, I have trouble, and I don't have time to explain. I don't even know how I would explain. I need help. What can I do? Take me to the place where we had the fight. Victor nodded. Easy enough. The man turned and started out toward the dark woods. Chapter 4 With two fingers, Nietzsche pushed a wet balsam bough out of her way as she followed several of the men through the dense woods. At the edge of a thickly forested ridge, they headed down a trail that switched back and forth in order to negotiate the steep descent. Slippery rocks made the climb down treacherous, it was a shorter route than the one they had used to carry Richard back to the deserted farmhouse after he'd been hurt. At the bottom, they picked their way over exposed, fractured rock and boulders, skirting the fringe of a boggy area guarded by a towering cluster of silvered skeletons of cedars standing vigil in the stagnant water. Runnels pouring down mossy banks carved deep cuts through the forest loam to expose speckled granite beneath. Several days of steady rain had left standing ponds in a number of low places. For the most part, the rain filled the woods with the pleasing fragrance of damp soil, but in low places and crannies, the damp, decomposing vegetation smelled of rot. Even though she was warm from the short, arduous trek, the damp, cool air still left Nietzsche's fingers and ears numb with cold. She knew that this far south in the old world, the heat and humidity would soon return with such vengeance that it would make her long for the unusual spell of cool weather. Having grown up in a city, Nietzsche had spent little time outdoors. At the Palace of the Prophets, where she had lived most of her life, outdoors meant the manicured lawns and gardens of the grounds covering Hallsband Island. 
The countryside had always seemed vaguely hostile to her, an obstacle between one city and another, something to be avoided. Cities and buildings were a refuge from the inscrutable dangers of the wilderness. More than that, though, cities had been where she toiled for the betterment of mankind. That work had had no end. Forests and fields had not been any of her concern. Nietzsche had never appreciated the beauty of hills, trees, streams, lakes, and mountains until she had come to know Richard. Even cities were new to her eyes after Richard. Richard made all of life a wonder. Carefully making her way up the slippery, dark rock of a brief rise, she finally spotted the rest of the men quietly waiting under the outstretched limbs of an ancient maple. Farther away, Richard crouched, studying a patch of ground. He finally rose to stare off into the dark expanse of woods beyond. Kara, his ever-present shadow, waited near him. Under the dense vault of soothing green, the moored Sith's red leather outfit stood out like a clot of blood on a tablecloth at tea. Nietzsche understood Kara's fierce and passionate protection of Richard. Kara, too, had once been his enemy. Richard had not simply gained Kara's blind allegiance by virtue of becoming the Lord Rahl. He had, far more importantly, earned her respect, trust, and loyalty. Her red leather outfit was intimidating by design, a promise of violence should anyone even think of causing him harm. It was not an empty promise. Mord Sith had been trained, since they were young, to be absolutely ruthless. While their primary purpose had been to capture the gifted and use their power against them, they were perfectly capable of using their ability against any opposition. Men who knew and trusted Kara without realizing they were doing it kept more distance from her when she wore her red leather. Nietzsche knew how it felt for Kara to be brought back from the numb madness of mindless duty to come to again value life. Off in the distance, through the gloom and shadows and dripping leaves, the hoarse croak of ravens echoed through the forest. Nietzsche caught the sickening stench of rotting carrion. Looking around for landmarks, as Richard had taught her, she spotted at the base of a rocky outcropping a pine that she remembered because it had a secondary trunk that curved out low to the ground almost like a seat. She recognized the spot. Beyond the screen of vines and brush lay the scene of the battle. Before Nietzsche could get to Richard, he ducked under low-hanging branches and started into the underbrush. Rising up on the far side, he waved his arms over his head and yelled like a lunatic. The deep shade among towering spruce erupted with the flapping of wings as, all at once, hundreds of the huge black birds bounded into the air shrieking with indignation at having their feast interrupted. At first it looked as if the birds might contest the field of battle, but when the air sang with the unique sound of Richard's sword being drawn, they fled into the darkness back among the trees, almost as if they knew what a weapon was and feared this one in particular. Their deep, angry croaking receded into the hazy mist. Richard, the triumphant scarecrow, glowered after them for a time before sliding his sword back into its scabbard. He finally turned to the men. All of you, please stay out of this area for now. His voice echoed off through the tall pines. Just wait back there. Considering herself sovereign in matters of Richard's safety, Kara paid no heed to his request. Instead, she followed him as he made his way into the small clearing beyond staying close but out of his way. Nietzsche wove her way among the saplings and wet ferns, moving past silent men, until she reached a thin patch of white birch topping a hillock that edged one side of the clearing. Hundreds of black eyes set in the white bark watched as she made her way among them to finally halt at the brow of the bank. When she rested her hand on the peeling, papery bark of one, she noticed the bolt from a crossbow stuck in the tree. Arrows jutted from other trees as well. Beyond, dead soldiers lay sprawled everywhere. The stench staggered her. 
The ravens had been driven off, but the flies, fearing no sword, remained to feast and breed. The first hatch of blowfly maggots were already hard at work. A good number of men were headless or were missing limbs. Some lay partly submerged in the stagnant pools of water. The ravens, along with other animals, had been at many of them, taking advantage of the opportunity afforded by gaping wounds. The thick leather armor, heavy hides, studded belts, chain mail, and wicked assortment of weapons no longer did these men any good. Here and there, the clothes around bloated bodies strained to remain buttoned, as if trying to maintain dignity where there could be none. Everything, from the men's flesh and bone to their fanatical beliefs, would lie here and rot in this forgotten patch of forest. Waiting in the trees, Nietzsche watched as Richard briefly inspected the corpses. That first morning, he'd already killed a great many of the soldiers before Victor and his men arrived and charged in to help him. She didn't know how long Richard had been fighting with that arrow in his chest, but it wasn't the kind of injury that anyone could endure for long. Huddled back under the partial shelter of the huge maple, the nearly two dozen men pulled cloaks tight against the chill and settled in to wait. Everywhere in the hushed forest, boughs of pine and spruce hung heavy and wet, quietly dripping water to the sodden ground. Here and there, the drooping branches of maple, oak, and elm lifted whenever a breath of breeze relieved them of their heavy load of water, making it appear as if the trees were gently waving. The humid air dampened what the drizzle didn't reach, making everyone miserable. Beyond the standing water, Richard crouched again, studying the ground. Nietzsche couldn't imagine what he was looking for. None of the men waiting back under the tree appeared at all interested in revisiting the site of the pitched battle or seeing the dead. They were content to wait back where they were. Killing was unnatural and difficult for these men. They fought for what was right, and they did what they had to do, but they didn't relish it. That in itself spoke to their values. They had buried three of their own dead, but they had not buried the bodies of close to a hundred soldiers who would have eagerly killed them had Richard not intervened. Nietzsche remembered her surprise the morning of the battle, coming upon Richard among all the dead and not at first understanding what had felled so many of them. Then she'd seen Richard slipping among those brutes, his sword moving with the fluid grace of a dance. It had been spellbinding to watch. With every thrust or slice, a man died. There had been a thick swarm of the soldiers, many bewildered by seeing so many of their fellows crashing to the ground. Most had been burly young men who always dominated because of their muscle, the type who enjoyed intimidating people. The soldiers moved in jerks and fits, chopping and lurching at Richard, but they always seemed to strike just after he had already gone. His flowing movement didn't fit the blundering attack they were looking for. They began to fear that the spirits themselves had set upon them. In a way, perhaps they had. Still, their numbers were too great for one man, even if that one man was Richard and he wielded the sword of truth. Just one of those ignorant, lumbering, brawny men connecting with a lucky swing of his axe would be all it took or one arrow finding its mark. Richard was neither invincible nor immortal. Victor and the rest of his men had arrived just in time. A few moments before, Nietzsche, too, made it to the scene. Victor's men had flown into the fray, drawing the attention away from Richard. Once Nietzsche arrived, she had ended it in a blinding flash as she unleashed her power against the soldiers still standing page 43. Fearful of being exposed not only to the impending storm, but far more troubling, to potentially untold numbers of enemy soldiers who could appear on the scene at any moment, Nietzsche had instructed the men to carry Richard back through the woods to the secluded farmhouse. The most she had been able to do for him on that terrible race to cover had been to trickle a thread of her Han into him hoping it would help keep him alive until she was able to do more. 
Nietzsche swallowed back the anguish of the ghastly memory. From a distance, she watched as Richard continued his meticulous inspection of the scene of the battle, ignoring the fallen soldiers for the most part, and paying particular attention to the surrounding area. She couldn't imagine what he hoped to discover. As he searched, he had begun moving in a back-and-forth pattern, progressing steadily outward from the small clearing, circling the scene in ever-widening arcs. At times, he inched along the ground on all fours. By late in the morning, Richard had vanished into the woods. Victor finally tired of the silent vigil and marched through a bed of ferns, nodding under the gentle fall of rain to where Nietzsche waited. What's going on? he asked her in a low voice. He's looking for something. I can see that. I mean, what's going on with this business about a wife? Nietzsche let out a tired sigh. I don't know. But you have an idea. Nietzsche spotted Richard briefly, moving among the trees some distance away. He was seriously wounded. People in that state sometimes suffer delirium. But he's healed now. He doesn't look or act feverish. He sounds normal enough in everything else, not like a person suffering visions and such. I've never seen Richard behave like this. Nor have I, Nietzsche admitted. She knew that Victor would never voice to her such concerns about Richard unless he was deeply worried. I would suggest we try to be as understanding as possible of what he's gone through and see if he doesn't soon start to get his thoughts sorted out. He was unconscious for days. He's only been awake for a few hours. Let's give him some time to clear his head. Victor considered her words before finally sighing and giving his nod of agreement. She was relieved that he didn't ask what they would do if Richard didn't soon get over his delirium. She saw Richard then returning through the shadows and drizzle. Nietzsche and Victor crossed the field of battle to meet him. On the surface, his face seemed to show only stony intensity, but as well as she knew him, Nietzsche could read in his expression that something was seriously wrong. Richard brushed leaves, moss, and twigs from the knees of his trousers as he finally reached them. Victor, these soldiers weren't coming to take back all to wrong. Victor's eyebrows went up. They weren't? No. They would need thousands of men for such a task, maybe tens of thousands. This many soldiers certainly weren't going to accomplish any such thing. And besides, if that was their intent, then what would be the point to slogging through the bush this far away from Alturang? Victor made a sour face in admission that it had to be that Richard was right. Then what do you think they were doing? It wasn't yet dawn when they were out here moving through the woods. That suggests to me that they might have been reconnoitering. Richard gestured off through the woods. There's a road in that direction. We'd been using it to travel up from the south. I had thought we would be camped far enough off it for the night to avoid trouble. Obviously, I was wrong. We last heard that you were to the south, Victor said. The road makes for quicker traveling, so we were using the trails to cut cross country so we could catch the road and take it south. It's an important road, Nietzsche added. It's one of the main arteries, one of the first that Jagang built. It allowed him to move soldiers swiftly. The roads he built enabled him to subdue all of the old world under the rule of the imperial order. Richard gazed off in the direction of the road, almost as if he could see through the wall of trees and vines. Such a well-made road also allows him to move supplies. I think that's what was happening here. Being this close to Alturang, and being well aware of the revolt that had taken place there, they were probably concerned about the possibility of an attack as they passed through the area. Since these soldiers weren't massing for an attack on Alturang, I'd guess they had something more important going on. Watching over supplies moving north for Jagang's army. He needs to crush the last of the resistance in the New World before the revolution at home burns his tail. Richard's gaze returned to Victor. I think these soldiers were reconnoitering, clearing the countryside in advance of a supply convoy. 
They were most likely scouting in the pre-dawn in the hopes of catching any insurgents asleep. As we were, Victor folded his muscular arms in obvious discontent. We never expected there would be any soldiers out here in these woods. We were sleeping like babies. If you hadn't been here and intercepted them, they would have soon snuck up on us where we slept. Then we'd likely be the ones feeding the flies and ravens instead of them. Everyone fell silent as they considered the might have been. Have you been hearing any news of supplies moving north? Richard asked. Sure, Victor said. There's a lot of talk about large quantities of goods going north. Some convoys are accompanied by new troops being sent to the war. What you say about these men scouting for such a convoy makes sense. Richard squatted down and pointed. See these tracks? These are a little more recent than the battle. It was a large contingent, most likely more soldiers, who came looking for these dead men. This was as far as they came. These side ridges in the prints show where they turned around, here. It looks like they came in, spotted the dead soldiers, and left. You can see by their tracks as they left that they were in a hurry. Richard stood and rested his left hand on the pommel of his sword. Had you not taken me away right after the battle, these soldiers would have been on us. Fortunately, they went back rather than search the woods. Why do you suppose they would do that? Victor asked. Why would they see these men freshly killed and then leave? They probably feared that a large force was lying in wait, so they rushed back to raise an alarm and ensure that the supply column was well protected. Since they didn't even take the time to bury their fellow soldiers, I'd guess that their most urgent concern was getting their convoy out of the area. Victor scowled at the tracks and then back in the direction of the dead soldiers. Well, he said as he ran his hand back over his head, wiping away beads of water, at least we can take advantage of the situation. While Jagang is preoccupied with the war, that gives us time down here to work to knock support for the order's rule right out from under them. Richard shook his head. Jagang may be preoccupied with the war, but that won't stop him from moving to restore his authority back here. If there's one thing we've learned about the Dreamwalker, it's that he's methodical about annihilating any and all opposition. Richard is right, Nietzsche said. It's a dangerous error to dismiss Jagang as a mere brute. While he is indeed brutal, he is also a highly intelligent individual and a brilliant tactician. He's had a lot of experience over the years. It's nearly impossible to goad him into acting impulsively. He can be bold, when he has good reason to believe boldness will win the day, but he's more given to calculated campaigns. He acts out of firm conviction, not bruised pride. He's content to let you think you've won, to let you think whatever you want for that matter, while he methodically plans how he will gut you. His patience is his most deadly quality. When he attacks, he is indifferent to how many casualties his army takes, as long as he knows he will have more than enough men left to win. But over the course of his career, until his campaign to take the new world anyway, he's tended to experience far fewer casualties than his enemies. That's because he holds no favor with naive notions of classic battle, of troops clashing on a field of honor. His way is usually to attack with such overwhelming numbers as to grind to dust the bones of his opposition. What his horde does to the vanquished is legend. For those in their path, the terror of the weight is unbearable. No sane person would want to be left alive to be captured by Jagang's men. For that reason, many welcome him with open arms, with blessings for their liberation, with supplications to be allowed to convert and join the order. The only sound under the embracing shelter of the trees was the gentle patter of the light rain. Victor did not doubt her word. She had been witness to such events. At times, the knowledge that she had been a part of that perverted cause that she had been a party to irrational beliefs that reduced men to nothing more than savages made Nietzsche long for death. Certainly she deserved no less. But she was now in the unique position of having the opportunity and ability to help reverse the success of the order. Setting matters right had become the cause that now drove her, sustained her, gave her purpose. 
It's only a matter of time before Jagang moves to retake all Turang, Richard said into the silence. Victor nodded. Yes, if Jagang thought the revolution was confined to all Turang, then he would logically put all his efforts into taking back the city and being as ruthless about it as Nietzsche says. But we're making sure that doesn't happen. He showed Richard a grim smile. We're lighting fires in cities and towns wherever we can, wherever people are ready to cast off their chains. We're pumping the bellows and spreading the flames of rebellion and freedom far and wide so that your gang can't confine and crush it. Don't fool yourself, Richard said. Al Turang is his home city. It's where the revolt against the order began. A popular rising in the very city where Jagang was building his grand palace undermines everything the imperial order teaches. It was to be the city, the place from where Jagang and the high priests of the Fellowship of Order were for all time to rule over mankind in the name of the Creator. The people destroyed that palace and instead embraced freedom. Jagang will not allow such subversion of his authority to stand. He must crush the rebellion there if the order is to survive to rule the old world and the new. It will be a matter of principal belief for him. He considers opposition to the ways of the fellowship of order to be blasphemy against the creator. He will not be shy about throwing his most brutal and experienced soldiers into the task. He will want to make a bloody example of you. I'd expect such an attack sooner rather than later. Victor looked unsettled, but not entirely surprised. And don't forget, Nietzsche added, the brothers of the Fellowship of Order who escaped will be among those working to help to re-establish the Order's authority. Such gifted men are no ordinary foe. We've hardly begun to root them out. All true enough, but you can't work iron to your will until you get it good and hot. Victor tightened a defiant fist before them. At least we've begun to do what must be done. Nietzsche conceded that with a nod and a small smile to soften the dark picture she had helped paint. She knew that Victor was right, that the task had to begin somewhere and at some point. He had already helped wring the hammer of freedom for a people who had all but given up hope. She just didn't want him to lose sight of the reality of the difficulty that lay ahead. Nietzsche would have been relieved to hear Richard dealing logically with the important matters at hand, but she knew better. When Richard locked on to something vital to him, he might address peripheral issues when necessary, but it would be a grave mistake to think that it diminished in the least his focus on his objective. In fact, he had delivered his warnings to Victor in swift summary, a mere matter to be gotten out of the way. She could see in his eyes that he was preoccupied with matters of far more importance to him. Richard finally turned his riveting gray eyes on Nietzsche. You weren't with Victor and his men? In a sudden flash of comprehension, Nietzsche realized why the matter of the soldiers and their supply convoy was important to him. It was a mere element of a greater equation. He was trying to unravel how and if the convoy figured into the illusion he still clung to. It was that calculation he was working to resolve. No, Nietzsche said. We'd had no word and didn't know what had happened to you. In my absence, Victor left to begin searching for you. Not long after, I returned to Alturang. I found out where Victor had gone and set out to join him. I was still some distance behind at the end of my second day of travel, so the third day I started out before dawn, hoping to catch up with him. I'd been traveling for almost two hours when I arrived nearby and heard the battle. I reached the fighting right at the end. Richard nodded thoughtfully. I woke, and Kalin was gone. Since we were close to Alturang, my first thought was that if I could find you, then maybe you could help me find Kalin. That's when I heard the soldiers coming through the woods. Richard gestured up a rise. I heard them coming through those trees there. I had darkness on my side. They hadn't seen me yet, so I was able to surprise them. Why didn't you hide? Victor asked. More were coming down from that way, and others were coming in from that direction. I didn't know how many there were, but the way they were fanned out suggested to me that they were searching the woods. That made hiding risky. 
As long as there was any possibility that Kalin might be close and maybe hurt, I couldn't run. If I hid and waited until the soldiers had a chance to find me, then I would lose the element of surprise. Worse yet, dawn was approaching. Darkness and surprise worked to my advantage. With Kalin missing, I didn't have a moment to lose. If they had her, I had to stop them. No one commented. Richard turned to Kara next. And where were you? Kara blinked in surprise. She had to think a moment before she could answer. I... I'm not exactly sure. Richard frowned. You are not sure? What do you remember? I was on watch. I was checking some distance out from our camp. I guess something must have aroused my concern, and so I was making sure the area was clear. I caught a whiff of smoke, and was starting to investigate that when I heard battle cries. So you rushed back? Kara idly pulled her braid forward over her shoulder. She looked to be having difficulty remembering clearly. No, she frowned in recollection. No, I knew what was happening, that you were being attacked because I heard the clash of steel and men dying. I had only just realized that it was Victor and his men camped off in that direction that it was the smoke from their campfire I smelled. I knew that I was much closer to them than you, so I thought that the smartest thing to do would be to rouse them and bring their help with me. That makes sense, Richard said. He wearily wiped beads of rain from his face. That's right, Victor said. Kara was right there close when I heard the clash of steel as well. I remember because I was lying awake in the quiet. Richard's brow drew together. He looked up. You were awake? Yes. The howl of a wolf woke me. Chapter 5 With sudden intensity, Richard leaned in a little toward the blacksmith. You heard wolves howl? No, Victor said as he frowned in recollection. There was just one. The three of them waited in silence as Richard stared off into the distance as if he were mentally trying to fit together the pieces of some great puzzle. Nietzsche glanced over her shoulder at the men back near the maple tree. Some yawned as they waited. Some had found seats on a fallen log. A few were engaged in hushed conversation. Others, arms folded, leaned against the trunks of trees and watched the surrounding woods as they waited. It didn't happen this morning, Richard whispered to himself. When I was waking up this morning, when I was still half asleep, I was really remembering what had happened the morning Kalin disappeared. The morning of the battle, Nietzsche said softly in correction. Lost in thought, Richard didn't appear to hear her correction. I must have been remembering for some reason what happened back when I woke that morning. He turned suddenly and seized her arm. A rooster crowed when I was being carried back to the farmhouse. Surprised by his abrupt change of subject and not knowing what he was getting at, Nietzsche shrugged. I suppose it could have. I don't remember. Why? There was no wind. I remember hearing the rooster crow and looking up and seeing motionless tree limbs above me. There was no wind at all. I remember how dead still it was. You're right, Lord Raal. Kara said. I remember when I ran into Victor's camp seeing the smoke from the fire going straight up because the air was dead calm. I think that was why we could hear the clash of steel and the cries from so far away, because there wasn't even a breath of breeze to cut the sound from carrying. If it helps, the blacksmith said, there were a few chickens roaming around when we brought you to the farm. And you're right, there was a rooster and it did crow. Matter of fact, we were trying not to be found so that Nietzsche could have the time to heal you, and I was afraid that the rooster might attract unwanted attention, so I told the men to cut its throat. After hearing Victor's account, Richard drifted back into thought. He tapped a finger against his lower lip as he considered yet another piece of his puzzle. Nietzsche thought he might have forgotten they were standing there. She leaned a little closer to him. So... He blinked and finally looked at her. 
It had to be that when I woke today, I was really remembering that morning. Remembering for a reason. Sometimes you do that. Remember because there was some part of it that doesn't make sense. Remember for some reason. What reason? Nietzsche asked. The wind. There was no wind that morning. But I remember that when I woke that morning in the faint light of false dawn, I saw tree limbs moving like in a breeze. Nietzsche was not just confused by his concern for wind, but worried for his state of mind. Richard, you were asleep and just waking up. It was dark. You probably just thought you saw the tree branches moving. Maybe, was all he said. Maybe it was the soldiers coming, Kara offered. No, he said, dismissing her suggestion with an irritable wave of his hand. That was a little later, after I'd discovered that Kalin was missing. Seeing that neither Victor nor Kara was going to argue the point, Nietzsche decided to hold her tongue as well. Richard seemed to put the puzzle from his mind. He turned a deadly serious expression on the three of them. Look, I have to show you all something. But you need to realize, despite how little you may be able to make out, that I know what I'm talking about. I don't expect you to take my word, but you need to understand that I have a lifetime of experience in this and routinely used such ability. I trust each of you in your area of expertise. This is mine. Don't close your minds to what I have to show you. Nietzsche, Kara, and Victor shared a look. With a nod to Richard, Victor set his reservations aside and turned to the men. You boys keep your eyes open now. He circled a finger in the air. There could be soldiers about, so let's keep it quiet and stay alert. Farron, double-check the area. The men nodded. Some came to their feet, apparently glad to have something to do other than just sit there wet and cold. Four men set out through the trees to set up guard. Farron handed his pack and bedroll to one of the other men for safekeeping before knocking an arrow and slipping quietly into the brush. The young man was learning the trade of blacksmithing from Victor. Raised on a farm, he also had a natural talent for scouting unseen in the woods. He idolized Victor. Nietzsche knew that Victor was fond of the young man as well, but because he was fond of him, he was probably harder on him than on the other men. Victor had told her once, referring to his tough demands of his apprentice, that you had to pound the imperfections out of iron and work it hard if you wanted to shape it into something truly worthwhile. Since the battle, Victor had had sentries and lookouts on constant watch while Farron and several of the others scouted the surrounding forest. None of them had wanted to take any chance that enemy soldiers would unexpectedly come upon them while Nietzsche was trying to save Richard's life. After she had done all she could for Richard, Nietzsche had healed a nasty gash to one man's leg and taken care of a few other less serious wounds suffered by a half dozen other men. Since the morning of the battle, and Richard being hurt, she had gotten little sleep. She was exhausted. After watching the men set about the tasks assigned them, Victor clapped Richard on the shoulder. Show us, then. Richard led Kara, Victor, and Nietzsche past the clearing with the dead men, and then off through the woods. He took a route between trees where the ground was more open. At the crest of a gentle rise, he stopped and crouched down. Seeing Richard on bended knee, his cloak draped over his back, his sword in a gleaming scabbard at his hip, his hood pushed back to expose strands of wet hair lying against his muscular neck, his bow and quiver strapped over his left shoulder, he looked at once regal, a warrior king, and at the same time like nothing so much as the wilderness guide from a distant land that he had once been. With intimate familiarity, his fingers brushed the pine needles, twigs, crumbles of leaves, bark, and loam. Nietzsche could sense, just by that touch, his breadth of understanding, or the seemingly simple things spread out before them, yet to him those things revealed another world. Richard remembered then his purpose and gestured, urging them to squat down close beside him. Here, he said, pointing. See this? 
His fingers carefully traced a vague depression in the dense tangle of forest litter. This is Kara's footprint. Well, that's no surprise, Kara said. This is the way we came in from the road on our way to where we set up camp back there. That's right, Richard leaned out a little, pointing as he went on. See here, and then off there? Those are more of your tracks, Kara. See how they come in here in a line showing where you were walking? Kara shrugged suspiciously. Sure. Richard moved to his right. They all followed. He again carefully traced a depression so they could make it out. Nietzsche couldn't see anything at all in the forest floor until he carefully drew the outline with a finger just above the ground. In doing so, he seemed to make the footprint magically appear for them. After he pointed it out, Nietzsche could tell what it was. This is my track, he said, watching it as if fearing that were he to look away, it might vanish. The rain works to wear them down, some places more than others, but it hasn't made all of them disappear. With a finger and thumb, he carefully lifted a wet brown oak leaf from the center of the print. Look, you can see under here how the pressure of my weight under the ball of my foot broke these small twigs. See? Rain can't obliterate things like that. He looked up at them to make sure they were all paying attention and then pointed off into the shadowy mist. You can see my tracks coming in this direction toward us just like Kara's. He stretched out and quickly traced two more vague depressions in the matted forest floor to show them what he meant. See? You can still make them out. What's the point? Victor asked. Richard glanced back over his shoulder again before gesturing between the sets of tracks. See the distance between Kara's tracks and mine? When we walked in here, I was on the left and Kara was to my right. See how far apart our tracks are? What of it? Nietzsche asked as she pulled the hood of her cloak forward, trying to shield her face from the frigid drizzle. She pulled her hands back under the cloak and snugged them in her armpits for warmth. They're that far apart, Richard said, because when we walked through here, Kalen was in the middle, between us. Nietzsche stared again at the ground. She was no expert, so she wasn't especially surprised that she couldn't see any other tracks. But this time, she didn't think that Richard could either. And can you show us Kalen's tracks, she asked. Richard turned a look on her of such intensity that it momentarily halted the breath she was about to take. That's the point. He held up a finger with the same deliberate care with which he lifted his blade. Her tracks are gone. Not washed away by the rain, but gone. Gone as if they were never there. Victor let out a very quiet and very troubled sounding sigh. If she was shocked, Kara hid it well. Nietzsche knew that he hadn't told them all of what he had to say, so she remained guarded in her question. You're showing us that there are no tracks from this woman? That's right. I've searched. I found my tracks and Kara's tracks in various places, but where Kalin's tracks should be, there are none. In the uncomfortable silence, no one wanted to say anything. Nietzsche finally took it upon herself to do so. Richard, you have to know why that is. Don't you see now? It's just your dream. There are no tracks because this woman doesn't exist. With him there on his knees before her, looking up at her, it seemed she could see his soul laid bare in his gray eyes. She would have given nearly anything at that moment to be able to simply comfort him, but she couldn't do that. Nietzsche had to force herself to go on. You said yourself that you know about tracking, and yet even you can't find any tracks left by this woman. This should put the matter to rest. This should finally convince you that she just doesn't exist, that she never did exist. She took a hand from under her cloak from its warm resting place and gently laid it on his shoulder in an effort to soften her words. You need to let it go, Richard. He looked away from her eyes as he drew his lower lip through his teeth. It's not as simple a picture as you're painting it, he said in a calm voice. 
I'm asking you all to look, just look, and try to understand the significance of what it is I'm showing you. Look at how far apart Kara and my tracks are. Can't you see that there was a third person there between us as we walked? Nietzsche wearily rubbed her eyes. Richard, people don't always walk close together. Maybe you and Kara were both looking around for any sign of threat as you walked through here. Or maybe you were both just tired and not paying attention. There could be any number of simple explanations as to why you two weren't walking closer together. When only two people walk together, they don't habitually walk this far apart. He pointed behind them. Look at the tracks we made coming over here. Kara again walked to my right. Look at how much closer together the tracks are. That's typical of two people walking side by side. You and Victor were behind us. Look at how close together your tracks are. These tracks are different. Can't you see by their nature that they're this far apart because there was another person walking between us? Richard. Nietzsche paused. She didn't want to argue. She was tempted to keep quiet and let him have his way, let him believe what he wanted to believe. And yet silence would be feeding a lie, lending life to an illusion. While she ached for his difficulty, and wanted to be on his side, she couldn't let him delude himself or she would be causing him greater harm. He could never get better, never fully recover, until he faced the truth of the real world. Helping him see reality was the only way she could really help him. Richard, she said softly, trying to get that truth through to him without sounding harsh or condescending, your tracks are there, and Kara's tracks are there. We can see that. You showed us. There are no others. You showed us that too. If she was there between you and Kara, then why are her tracks not? They all hunched their shoulders in the wet and cold as they waited. Richard finally gathered his composure and spoke in a clear, firm voice. I think Kalen's tracks were erased with magic. Magic? Kara asked, suddenly alert and ill-tempered. Yes, I think that whoever took Kaelin erased her tracks with magic. Nietzsche was dumbfounded and made no attempt to conceal it. Victor's gaze shifted back and forth between Nietzsche and Richard. Can that be done? Yes, Richard insisted. When I first met Kaelin, Dark and Rahl was after us. He was close on our trail. Zed, Kalen, and I had to run. If Dark and Rawl had caught us, we would have been finished. Zed's a wizard, but he isn't as powerful as Dark and Rawl was, so Zed cast some magic dust back down the trail to hide our tracks. That has to be what happened here. Whoever took Kalen covered their tracks with the use of magic. Victor and Kara glanced at Nietzsche for confirmation. As a blacksmith, Victor was not familiar with magic. Mord Sith didn't like magic and pointedly avoided the details of its workings. Their well-honed instinct was simply to violently eliminate anyone with magic if they posed even a potential threat to the Lord Rahl. Both Victor and Kara waited to hear what Nietzsche had to say about the possibility of using magic to cover tracks. Nietzsche hesitated. Her being a sorceress didn't mean that she knew everything there was to know about magic, but still... I suppose that such a use of magic is in theory possible, but I've never heard of it being done. Nietzsche made herself look into Richard's expectant gaze. I think the explanation of why there are no tracks is quite a bit simpler, and I think you know it, Richard. Richard couldn't mask his disappointment. Looking at this by itself and not being familiar with the nature of tracks and what they reveal, I'll grant that maybe it's hard to see what I'm saying. But this isn't all. I have something else to show you that may help you see the whole picture. Come on. Lord Rahl, Kara said as she tucked a wet wisp of hair back under the hood of her dark cloak and avoided looking at him. Shouldn't we be getting on to other important matters? I have something important to show the three of you. Are you saying that you wish to wait here while I show Victor and Nietzsche? 
Her blue eyes turned up to him. Of course not. Fine, let's go. Without further protest, they followed him at a quick pace as he headed in a northerly direction, deeper into the woods. They tiptoed from rock to rock to cross a broad ravine with dark eddies of murky water flowing through it. When Nietzsche nearly slipped and fell, Richard took her hand and helped her across. His big hand was warm, but not feverish at least. She wished he would slow down and not stress his fragile health. The gentle slope on the far side revealed itself only by degree as they climbed higher through the drizzle and trailers of low clouds. To the left loomed the dark shadow of a rocky rise. Nietzsche could hear the burbling rush of water tumbling down that rise. As they went deeper into the swirling gray mist and dense green vegetation, huge birds lifted from their perches. Wings spread wide, the wary creatures silently glided away beyond sight. Harsh screeches of unseen animals echoed through the somber woods. With the mass of overlapping spruce and balsam boughs and the tangled dead limbs of ancient oaks draped with gossamer moss curtains, to say nothing of the gloomy drizzle, vines, and dense tangle of saplings struggling to reach up for the elusive light, it was not easy to see very far. Only lower to the forest floor, where the sunlight rarely reached, was it more open. Farther into the sodden forest, dark trunks of trees stood clear of the brush and thick foliage, like sentinels watching the three people move among their gathered army. The ground where Richard took them was easier traveling since it was more open and covered with soft, sprawling mats of pine needles. Nietzsche imagined that even on the sunniest of days, only thin streamers of sunlight ever penetrated all the way down to the forest floor. Off to the sides here and there, she saw nearly impenetrable tangles of brush and tightly knitted walls of young conifers. The expanse under the towering pines made a natural but unmarked pathway. At last, Richard halted, lifting his arms out to his sides so that they wouldn't step out past him. Spread out before them was more of the same, sparse growth sprouting among the thick bed of brown needles. Following his direction, they squatted down beside him. Richard gestured over his right shoulder. Back that way is where Kara, Kalin, and I came in on the night we camped, by where the battle took place. In various places around our camp are my tracks from when I stood second watch and Kara's tracks from third watch. Kalin had first watch that night. There are no tracks from her watch. His glance to each of them in turn was a silent request to hear him out before they started arguing. Back that way, he said, pointing as he went on, was where the soldiers were coming up through the woods. From over in that direction, Victor, you and your men came to join the battle. In nearly the same place are your tracks from when you carried me back to the farmhouse. Off that way, where I already showed you, are the tracks of other soldiers who came in and found their fellow soldiers dead. None of us or any of the soldiers has been up this way. Here, where we are now, there are no tracks. Look around. You'll see only my fresh tracks from this morning when I was searching. Other than that, there are no footprints from anyone else coming through here. In fact, there's no sign that anyone has ever been here. At least it would appear that no one has ever been here before. Victor idly rubbed his thumb on the steel shaft of the mace hanging from his belt. But you think otherwise? Yes. Even though there are no tracks, someone did come this way and they left evidence. Richard leaned out and with one finger touched a smooth rock about the size of a loaf of bread. As they hurried past, they stumbled on this rock. Victor seemed caught up in the story. How can you tell? Look carefully at the markings on the rock. As Victor leaned in a bit, Richard pointed. See here, the way the top of the rock, where it was exposed to the air and weather, as the pale, tannish yellow discoloration of lichen and such. And here, like the hull of a boat below the waterline, you can see the dark brown rime that shows where the belly of the rock 
had been lying beneath the ground. But it's not lying that way now. It's not settled into its socket in the ground, its recent resting place. It's now lifted the little out of that socket and turned part way over. See how a section of the dark bottom is now exposed? Were it out of the ground for longer, the dark color would be worn away and the lichen would begin to grow there, too. But it hasn't had that much time yet. This is recent. Richard waggled his finger back and forth. Look at the ground, here, on this side of the rock. You can see the socket where the rock originally rested, but now the rock has been shoved back a little, leaving a void between this side of the rock and the wall of the cavity. On the back side, away from us, because the rock was recently disturbed, you can still see a ridge of dirt and debris that has been pushed up. The open socket on this side and the ridge on the far side shows that whoever stumbled on this rock and disturbed it was moving away from our camp going north. But then where's their trail? Victor asked. Their footprints. Richard raked back his wet hair. The trail has been erased with magic. I searched. There is no trail. Look at the rock. It's been disturbed, kicked partway out of its resting place in the ground. But there is no scuff mark on it. While the rock wasn't moved much, it was moved. A boot grazing this rock enough to move it like this would have to leave a mark. Yet there is no mark, just as there are no other footprints. Nietzsche pushed her hood back. You're twisting everything you find around to fit what you want to believe, Richard. You can't have it both ways. If magic was used to erase their trail, then why is it that you are able to detect their trail by this rock? Probably because the magic they used erases footprints. The person who used that magic must not know a great deal about tracks or tracking. I don't think they're very familiar with the outdoors. When they used magic to erase their footprints, they probably never gave any thought to putting disturbed stones back in place. Richard, surely... Look around, he said as he swept his arm out. Look at how perfect the forest floor is. What do you mean? Victor asked. It's too perfect. Twigs, leaves, bark are too evenly distributed. Nature is more erratic. Nietzsche, Victor, and Kara peered at the ground. Nietzsche saw only a normal-looking forest floor. Here and there, small things, pine seedlings, spindly weeds, an oak sapling with only three big leaves, sprouted up through the litter of twigs, moss, bark, and fallen leaves sprinkled over the bed of pine needles. She didn't know all that much about tracks or tracking or forests, for that matter. Richard always left blazes on trees when he wanted her to be able to find and follow his trail, but it didn't look like anyone had been through the place, nor did it look overly perfect, as Richard suggested. As she looked around, it appeared the same as other places she eyed for comparison. Victor and Kara seemed equally confounded. Richard, Nietzsche said with strained patience, I'm sure there could be any number of explanations as to why a rock looks disturbed to you. For all I know, it could be disturbed, as you suggest, but maybe an elk or a deer kicked it as they went by, and over time their tracks have been worn away. Richard was shaking his head. No, look at the socket. It's still well formed. You can read by how much the edges have degraded that it happened only a few days ago. Time, especially in the rain, erodes such edges and works to fill in the gap. Any deer or elk kicking this rock would have left tracks that would be just as recent. Not only that, but a hoof would have scuffed it the same as a boot. I'm telling you, three days ago, someone stumbled on this rock. Nietzsche gestured. Well, that dead branch over there could have fallen on it and disturbed it. If it did, then the lichen growing on the rock would show the scar of the impact, and the branch would show evidence that it had hit something hard. It doesn't. I already looked. Kara threw up her hands. Maybe a squirrel jumped from a tree and landed on it. Not nearly heavy enough to have moved this rock, Richard said. Nietzsche drew a weary breath. So what you're saying is that the fact that there are no tracks from this woman, Kalin, proves that she exists. No, that's not what I'm saying. 
not the way you're putting it anyway, but it does confirm it if you look at everything together, if you put it all into context. Nietzsche's hands fisted at her sides. There were important matters that had to be addressed. They were running out of time. Instead of dealing with urgent matters in need of their attention, they were out in the middle of the woods looking at a rock. She could feel the blood going to her face. That's ridiculous. All you've shown us, Richard, is proof that this woman you imagined is just that, imagined. She doesn't exist. She left no tracks because you only dreamed her. There's nothing mysterious about it. It's not magic. It's simply a dream. Richard abruptly rose up before her. He changed in a heartbeat from a man of calm intensity to a figure of heart-stopping presence, power, and awakening anger. But rather than confront her, he took a step past her, back toward the way they'd come from, and stopped. Still and tense, Richard stared back through the woods. Something's wrong, he said in low warning. Kara's Aegeel spun up into her fist. Victor's brow tightened as his fingers found the mace hanging from his belt. In the distance back through the dripping forest, Nietzsche heard the sudden wild alarm cries of ravens. The cries that came next reminded her of nothing so much as the sounds of bloody murder. Chapter 6 Richard bounded back through the woods, back toward the waiting men, back toward the screams. He raced headlong through a blur of trees, branches, brush, ferns, and vines. He leaped over rotting logs and used a well-planted boot to bound over a boulder. He dodged his way through stands of young pines and a cluster of flowering dogwood. Without slowing, he batted aside tamarack limbs and ducked under balsam boughs. Nets of dead branches on the lower trunks of young spruce trees snatched at his clothes as he charged past. More than once, dead limbs jutting out spear-like from larger trees nearly impaled him before he sidestepped at the last instant. Running at such a reckless speed through dense woods, let alone in the rain, was treacherous. It was hard to recognize hazards in time to avoid them. Any one of a number of protruding branches could easily gouge out an eye. One slip on wet leaves or moss or rocks could cause a skull-splitting tumble. Driving a foot down into a crevice or fissure at a dead run would likely shatter a leg. Richard had once known a young man who had done just that. His broken leg and ankle had never mended right, leaving him partially crippled for life. Richard focused his concentration on his intended path, taking as much care as possible without slowing. He dared not slow. The whole way as he ran, he heard the terrible screams and cries, the shrieks and the sickening snapping sounds. He could also hear Kara, Victor, and Nietzsche crashing through the brush behind him. He didn't wait for them to catch up. Every long stride, every leap took him farther out ahead of them. Running as fast as he could, gasping for air, Richard was surprised to find himself winded before he should have been. At first disconcerted, he then remembered the reason. Nietzsche had said that he hadn't yet recovered, and because he had lost a lot of blood, he would need rest to gain back his strength. He kept running. He would have to make do with what strength he had. It wasn't that much further. More than that, though, he kept running because the men needed help. These were men who had come to his aid when he had been in trouble. He didn't know what was happening, but it was clear to Richard that they were in some kind of peril. On the morning of the attack, if he'd known more about how to call upon his gift, he might have been able to use that ability to stop the soldiers before Victor and his men had arrived. Had he been able to do that, three of those men would not have died in the fighting. Of course, had Richard not been where he was and taken action to stop the soldiers, then Victor and his men might well have all ended up murdered at their camp, most while they slept. Richard couldn't help feeling that he might have done more. He didn't want to see any of these men hurt. He kept running with all his strength, holding back nothing. He would use whatever strength he had. He could gain back his strength. Lives could not be gotten back. There were times like this when he wished that he knew more about how to call upon his gift but his ability regrettably worked differently than in others. 
Instead of functioning through cognizant direction, as Nietzsche's power did, Richard's ability worked through anger and need. The morning that the Imperial soldiers had poured in all around him, he had drawn his sword for the purpose of his survival, and in so doing had given his anger over to the weapon. Unlike his own gift, he knew that he could count on the power of his sword. Others with the gift learned to use their ability from a young age. Richard never had. It had been an upbringing of peace and security that had given him a chance at life, at growing up to profoundly value life. The drawback was that such an upbringing had also left him unaware of and ignorant of his own talent. Now that Richard was grown, though, learning to use his latent ability was proving more than difficult, not only because of his upbringing, but because his particular form of the gift was so extraordinarily rare. Neither Zed nor the Sisters of the Light had had any success at all in teaching him how to consciously direct his power. He knew little more than what Nathan Rahl, the prophet, had told him, that his power was most often sparked through anger and a particular specific kind of desperate need, which Richard had not been able to identify or isolate. As far as he had been able to determine, the character of the need required to ignite his power was unique to each circumstance. Richard also knew that using magic did not involve whim. No amount of wishing or straining could ever produce results. The initiation and use of magic required specific conditions. He just didn't understand how to produce or provide those conditions. Even wizards of great ability sometimes had to use books to ensure that they got the details right if the specific magic they wanted was to work. At a young age, Richard had memorized one of those books, the Book of Counted Shadows. That was the book which Dark and Rawl had been hunting for after he had put the boxes of Orden in play. On the morning Kalin had vanished to meet the threat of the seemingly endless ranks of soldiers charging in upon him, Richard had had to depend on his sword and not his own innate powers. The frenzied fighting had taken him to the brink of exhaustion. At the same time, his worry for Kalin left him distracted to the point where his mind wasn't fully on the fight. He knew that allowing such a diversion to beguile his attention was dangerous and foolish, but it was Kalin. He had been helplessly worried for her. Had his need not summoned his gift when it did, the hail of arrows suddenly showering in at him would have been fatal a few dozen times over. He hadn't seen the bolt fired from a crossbow. As it shot for his heart, he only recognized the threat at the last possible instant, and because of the crucial need to also stop the three soldiers lunging for him at the same time, he'd only been able to deflect the path of the arrow's flight, not stop it. It seemed like he'd already gone over the memory a thousand times and come up with any number of could-haves and should-haves that, in his mind's harsh judgment, would have prevented what had happened. As Nietzsche had said, though, he was not invincible. As he plunged through the woods, the forest unexpectedly fell silent. The echoing screams died away. The misty green wilderness was again left to the muted whisper of the light rain falling through the leafy canopy. In the outwardly peaceful and once again quiet world around him, it almost seemed as if he had only imagined the terrible sounds he'd heard. Despite his fatigue, Richard didn't slow. As he ran, he listened for any sign of the men, but he could hear little more than his own labored breathing, his heartbeat pounding in his ears, and his swift footfalls. Occasionally, he also heard branches behind him breaking as the other three tried to catch up with him, but they were still falling farther behind. For some reason, the eerie calm was somehow more frightening than the screams had been. What had started out sounding like the ravens, hoarse croaks rising into the kinds of terrified cries an animal makes only when it's being killed, had somewhere along the line begun to sound human. And now there was only the menacing silence. Richard tried to convince himself that he had only imagined that the screams had turned human. As chilling as such cries had been, it was the haunting unnatural stillness after they'd ended that made goose flesh prickle the hair at the back of his neck. 
Just before he reached the brink of the clearing, Richard finally drew his sword. The singular sound of freeing the blade sent the cutting ring of steel through the damp woodland, ending the silence. Instantly, the heat of the sword's anger flooded through every fiber of his being to be answered in kind by his own anger. Once again, Richard committed himself to the magic he knew and upon which he could depend. Filled with the sword's power, he ached for the source of the threat and lusted to end it. There had been a time when fear and uncertainty made him reluctant to surrender to the rising storm brought forth from the ancient wizard-wrought blade, hesitant to answer the call with his own anger, but he had long since learned to let himself go into the rapture of the rage. It was that righteous wrath that he had learned to bend to his will. It was that power he directed to his purpose. There had been those in the past who'd coveted the sword's power, but in their blind lust for that which belonged to others had ignored the darker perils they stirred by using such a weapon. Instead of being masters of the magic, they had become servants to the blade, to its anger, and to their own rapacious greed. There had been those who had used the power of the weapon for evil ends. Such was not the fault of the blade. The use of the sword for good or for evil was the conscious choice made by the person wielding it, and all responsibility fell to them. Racing through the wall of tree limbs, shrubs, and vines, Richard came to a halt at the edge of the clearing where the soldiers had fallen in the battle several days before. Sword in hand, he gasped for air, despite how putrid the air smelled, struggling to catch his breath. At first, as he scanned the bizarre scene spread out before him, he had trouble comprehending what it was he was seeing. Dead ravens lay everywhere, not just dead, but ripped apart. Wings, heads, and parts of carcasses littered the clearing. Feathers by the thousands had settled like black snow over the rotting corpses of the soldiers. Frozen in shock for only an instant and still breathless, Richard knew that this was not what he sought. Tearing across the battle site, he bounded up the short bank through the gaps in the trees and over trampled vegetation toward where the men had been waiting. The rage of the sword spiraled up through him as he ran, making him forget that he was tired, that he was winded, that he wasn't yet fully recovered, preparing him for the fight to come. In that moment, the only thing that mattered to Richard was getting to the men, or more precisely, getting at the threat to the men. There was a matchless rapture in killing those who served evil. Evil unchallenged was evil sanctioned. Destroying evil was really a celebration of the value of life, made real by destroying those who existed to deny others their life. Therein lay the fundamental purpose behind the sword's essential, indispensable requirement for rage. Rage blunted the horror of killing, stripped away the natural reluctance to kill, leaving only its naked necessity if there was to be true justice. As Richard raced out of the stand of birch, the first thing that caught his attention was the maple tree where the men had been waiting. The lower limbs had been stripped bare of leaves. It looked like a storm had swooped down to rip through the woods. Where only a short time ago small trees grew, now all that was left was shattered stumps. Branches thick with shimmering wet leaves or pine needles lay scattered about. Huge, jagged splinters of tree trunks stuck up from the ground like spent spears after a battle. Beneath the maple, scattered across the forest floor, was a scene that at first Richard could make no sense of. Nearly everything that before had been some shade of green, whether dusty sage, yellowish, or rich emerald, was now tainted with the stain of red. Richard stood panting, his heart pounding, fighting to focus the rage on a threat he could not identify. He scanned the shadows and darkness back among the trees, looking for any movement. At the same time, he struggled to sort out the confusion of what he was seeing on the ground before him. Kara skidded to a halt to his left, ready for a fight. An instant later, Victor stumbled to a stop on his right, his mace held in a tight fist. 
Nietzsche raced in right behind, no weapon evident, but Richard could sense the air around her virtually crackling with her power, ready to be unleashed. Dear spirits, the blacksmith whispered. His six-bladed mace, a deadly weapon the man had made himself, rose in his fist as he cautiously started forward. Richard lifted his sword in front of Victor to bar him from going any farther. His chest against the blade, the blacksmith reluctantly heeded the silent command and stopped. What at first had been a bewildering sight became at last all too clear. A man's forearm, missing the hand, but still covered with a brown flannel shirt sleeve, lay in a bed of ferns at Richard's feet. Not far away stood a heavy laced boot with a jagged white shin bone stripped of sinew and muscle jutting out from the top. In a thicket of rough leaf dogwood just to the side lay a section of a torso, its flesh torn away to lay bare a section of the spine and blanched rib bones. Squiggles of pink viscera lay strewn over the log where the men had been sitting. Ragged pieces of scalp and skin lay atop bare rock and scattered everywhere through the grass and bushes. Richard could not imagine what power could have caused such a shocking scene. A thought struck him. He glanced back over his shoulder at Nietzsche. Sisters of the Dark? Nietzsche shook her head as she studied the carnage. There are a few similar characteristics, but on balance, this is nothing like the way they kill. Richard didn't know if that was comforting news or not. Slowly, carefully, he stepped forward among the still bleeding remains. It didn't look to him like it had been a battle. There were no cuts from swords or axes, no arrows or spears to mark the battlefield. None of the limbs or mangled ribbons of muscle appeared to have been cut. Every piece looked as if it had been torn away from where it belonged. It was so horrific a sight, so incomprehensible, that it was beyond sickening. Richard found it disorienting trying to conceive of what could have created such devastation, not just of the men, but of the landscape where they had been. From somewhere beyond the boiling rage of the sword's magic, he felt an agony of sorrow for what he had not been able to stop, and he knew that that sorrow would only grow. But right then, he wanted nothing so much as to get his hands on whoever or whatever had done this. Richard, Nietzsche whispered from close behind, I think it best if we get out of here. The direct, calm tone of her voice could not have been any more compelling a warning. Filled with the rage from the sword in his fist and his own impassioned anger at what he was seeing, he ignored her. If there was anyone left alive, he had to find them. There's no one left, Nietzsche murmured, as if in answer to his thoughts. If the threat still lurked nearby, he needed to know. Who could have done this? Victor whispered, clearly not interested in leaving until he had the guilty party in his grip. It doesn't look like anything human, Kara answered in quiet indictment. As Richard stepped carefully through the remains, the silence of the shrouding woods pressed in on him like a great weight. No birds called, no bugs buzzed, no squirrels chattered. The muting effect of the heavy overcast and drizzle only served to thicken the hush. Blood dripped from leaves, branches, and the tips of bent grasses. The trunks of trees were splattered with it. The coarse bark of an ash was smeared with oozing tissue. A hand, fingers open and slack, empty of any weapon, lay palm up on a gravel slope beneath the large leaves of a mountain maple. Richard spotted the footprints of where they all had entered the area, and some of his own footprints where he had left only a short time ago with Nietzsche, Kara, and Victor. Many of the remains lay in virgin forest where none of them had walked. There were no peculiar footprints among the carnage, although there were unexplained places where the ground had been ripped open. Some of those gouges cut right through thick roots. Taking a better look, Richard realized that the plowed gashes were places where men had been smashed to the ground with such violence that it had torn open the forest floor. In some spots, 
flesh still clung to the exposed ends of splintered roots. Kara gripped his shirt at the shoulder, trying to urge him back. Lord Rall, I want you away from here. Richard pulled his shoulder free of her grip. Quiet. As he stepped silently among the remains, the countless voices of those who had used the sword in the past whispered in the back of his mind. Don't focus on what you're seeing, on what is done. Watch for what caused it and might yet come. Now is the time for vigilance. Richard hardly needed such a warning. He was gripping the wire-wound hilt of the sword so tightly that he could feel the raised lettering of the word truth formed by gold wire woven through the silver. That golden word bit into the flesh of his palm on one side and his fingertips on the other. At his feet, a man's head stared up at him from among scrub sumac. A mute cry twisted the expression fixed on the face. Richard knew him. His name had been Nuri. All that this young man had learned, all that he had experienced, all that he had planned for, the world he had begun to make for himself was ended. For all these men, the world was finished. The one life they had had was gone forever. The agony of that terrible loss, that ghastly finality, threatened to extinguish the rage from the sword and swamp him in sorrow. All these men were loved and cherished by those waiting for them to return. Each one of these individuals would be grieved over with heartache that would indelibly mark the living. Richard made himself move on. Now was not the time to grieve. Now was the time to find the guilty and visit upon them retribution and justice before they had the chance to do this to others. Only then could the living mourn for those precious souls lost. Despite how widely he searched, Richard didn't see a single body, not a body in the sense of a whole recognizable person, yet the entire area where the men had been waiting was littered with their remains. The surrounding woods also revealed parts of those remains, as if some of the men had tried to run. If that was the case, none had gotten far. As Richard moved through the trees, looking for any tracks that might help him identify who had killed these men, he kept one eye on the shadows off in the mist. He saw tracks of men who had run, but he saw no tracks chasing after them. As he came around an ancient pine, he was confronted by the top half of a man's chest hanging upside down from a splintered limb. The remains hung well above Richard's head. What was left of the armless torso had been impaled on the stump of a broken limb as if it were a meat hook. The face was fixed with unbridled terror. Being upside down, the hair, dripping blood, stood out straight from the scalp as if frozen in fright. Dear spirits, Victor whispered. Rage twisted his face. That's Ferran. Richard scanned the area, but saw nothing moving in the shadows. Whatever happened here, I don't think anyone escaped. He noticed that on the ground, where Ferran's blood dripped, there were no tracks. Kalen's tracks were gone as well. The pain, the horror of wondering if this might be the same thing that had happened to Kalen nearly buckled his knees. Not even the sword's rage was enough to shield him from the agony of that pain. Nietzsche, right behind him, leaned close. Richard, she said in a near whisper, we need to get out of here. Kara leaned in beside Nietzsche. I agree. Victor lifted his mace. I want those who did this. His knuckles were white around the steel grip. Can you track them? He asked Richard. I don't think that would be a good idea, Nietzsche said. Good idea or not, Richard told them, I don't see any tracks. He looked into Nietzsche's blue eyes. Perhaps you would like to try to convince me that I am imagining this as well. She didn't break eye contact with him, but she didn't answer his challenge either. Victor gazed up at Ferran. I told his mother that I'd watch over him. What am I going to say to his family now? Tears of rage and hurt glistened in his eyes as he pointed with the mace back to the rest of the remains. What am I going to say to their mothers and wives and children? That evil murdered them, Richard said, that you will not rest until you know justice is done. 
that vengeance will be had. Victor nodded, his anger flagging, misery now filling his voice. We have to bury them. No, Nietzsche said with grim authority. As much as I understand your want to care for them, your friends are no longer here among these pieces of wrecked bodies. Your friends are now with the good spirits. It is up to us not to join them. Victor's anger resurfaced. But we must. No, Nietzsche snapped. Look around. This was a blood frenzy. We don't want to get caught in it. We can't help these men. We need to get out of here. Before Victor could argue, Richard leaned close to the sorceress. What do you know about this? I told you before, Richard, that we needed to talk, but this is not the time or the place to do it. I agree, Kara growled. We need to get away from here. Looking from the remains of Ferran back to the bloody mess beneath the maple, Richard suddenly felt a sense of overwhelming loneliness. He wanted Kaelin so bad it hurt. He wanted her comfort. He wanted her safe. The agony of not knowing if she was alive and well was unbearable. Kara is right. Nietzsche urgently gripped Richard's arm. We don't know enough about what we're up against. But whatever did all this, I fear that as weak as you are, your sword can't protect us from it. And right now, neither can I. If it's still in these woods, now is not the time to confront it. Justice and vengeance need us to see them done. To do that, we must be alive. With the back of a hand, Victor wiped tears of grief and anger from his cheek. I hate to admit it, but I think Nietzsche's right. Whatever was looking for you, Lord Rall, Kara said, I don't want you here if it should happen to return. Richard noted the way Kara, in her red leather, no longer seemed out of place in the woods. She blended right in with all the blood. Still not ready to abandon the search for whatever had killed these men, and with a dark sense of alarm rising within him, Richard frowned at the moored Sith. What makes you think it was after me? I told you, Nietzsche said through gritted teeth, answering in Kara's stead, now is not the time and this is not the place to talk about it. There is nothing we can hope to accomplish here. These men are beyond our help. Beyond help. Was Kalen beyond help as well? He couldn't allow himself to believe that. He looked north. Richard didn't know where to search for her. Just because the rock that had been kicked out of its resting place had been found to the north of their camp didn't mean that whoever took Kalen went that way. They might have simply gone north, trying to avoid contact with Victor and his men and with the soldiers guarding the supply convoy. They might have only been trying to avoid being spotted until they got out of the immediate area. After that, they could have gone anywhere. But where? Richard knew that he needed help. He tried to think of who could help him with something like this. Who would believe him? Zed might believe him, but Richard didn't think his grandfather could offer the specific kind of help he needed in this circumstance. It was awfully far to go if it ended up that Zed's abilities didn't fit this particular kind of problem. Who would be willing to help him and might know something? Richard turned suddenly to Victor. Where can I get horses? I need horses. Where's the closest place? Victor was taken off guard by the question. He let the heavy mace hang, and with his other hand wiped rainwater back off his forehead as he considered the question. His brow bunched back up. Altorang would probably be the closest place, he said after a moment's thought. Richard slid his sword back into its sheath. Let's go. We need to hurry. Pleased with the decision to leave, Kara gave him a helpful shove in the direction of Alturang. Suspicion lurked in Nietzsche's eyes, but she was so relieved to have him start away from the sight of so much death that she didn't ask why he wanted horses. Weariness forgotten, the four of them hurried away from men beyond any help. As heartsick as they felt about leaving, each of them understood that it would be too dangerous to stay to try to bury these men. A burial of the dead was not worth the risk to their lives. With his sword put away, the anger extinguished. In its place welled up the crushing pain of grief for the dead. The forest seemed to weep with them. Worse yet was the dread of wondering what could have happened to Kalen. 
if she was in the hands of this evil. Think of the solution, Richard reminded himself. If he was to find her, he would need help. To get help, he needed horses. That was the immediate problem at hand. They still had half a day of daylight. He intended not to waste a moment of it. Richard led them away through the tangled woods at an exhausting pace. No one complained. Chapter 7 In the deepening gloom of approaching nightfall, Richard and Kara used thin, wiry pine tree roots they'd pulled up from the spongy ground to lash together the trunks of small trees. Victor and Nietzsche foraged the understory along the base of the heavily forested slope, cutting and collecting balsam boughs. As Richard held the logs together, Kara tied off the rope-like root. Richard cut the excess for use elsewhere and slipped the knife back into its sheath at his belt. Once he had the log framework securely in place against an overhang of rock, he started stacking the balsam boughs along the bottom. Kara tied random branches on from inside to keep them all in place for the night as Richard continued layering more up the poles. Victor and Nietzsche dragged armfuls of boughs close to keep him supplied as he worked. The area under the overhanging roof of rock was dry enough, it just wasn't large enough. The lean-to would expand the shelter so as to provide a snug place to sleep. Without a fire, it wouldn't be especially warm, but at least it would be dry. Throughout the day, the drizzle had turned to a slow, steady rain. While they had been on the move, they had been warm enough because of their exertion, but now that they had to stop for the night, the inexorable embrace of the cold had begun. Even in chilly weather that wasn't truly cold, being wet sapped a person of their necessary warmth and thus their strength. Richard knew that over time, constant exposure to even mildly chilly wet weather could steal enough vital heat from the body to severely debilitate and sometimes even kill a person. With as little sleep as he knew Nietzsche and Kara had gotten over the previous three days, and in his own weakened condition, Richard recognized that they needed a dry, warm place to get some rest, or they would all be in trouble. He couldn't allow anything to slow him down. For the whole of the afternoon and evening, they had set a steady, rapid pace on their march toward Alturang. After the brutal slaughter of the men, the four of them hadn't been particularly hungry, but they knew that they had to eat if they were to have the strength for the journey, so they nibbled on dried meats and travel biscuits as they made their way through the trackless wilderness. Richard was so exhausted he could hardly stand. Both to cut the distance and to avoid being spotted by anyone, he had guided the others through dense forest, most of it tough going, and all of it well off any trails. It had been a grueling day's travel. His head ached, his back ached, his legs ached. If they started early and kept up the strenuous pace, though, they might be able to reach all to a wrong in one more day's travel. After they got horses, the going would be easier as well as swifter. He wished he didn't need to go so far, but he didn't know what else to do. He couldn't spend forever searching the vast forests all around on the off chance he would find another rock that had been disturbed so that he then might have an idea of which direction Kalin had gone. He might never find another such rock, and even if he did, there was no reason to believe that if he kept going in that direction, he would find Kalin. Whoever took her might change direction without ever again disturbing a rock in a way that he would find it. Their regular tracks were gone. Richard knew no way to track someone when magic had made their tracks vanish. Nietzsche's gift wasn't able to help. Wandering around aimlessly wasn't going to solve anything. As reluctant as he was to leave the area where he had last seen Kalin, Richard didn't think that he had any other choice but to go for help. He went through the motions of building the shelter without giving the work much thought. In the failing light, Kara, concerned for his well-being, kept watching him out of the corner of her eye. She looked like she expected him to fall over at any moment, and if he did, she intended to catch him. As he worked, Richard mulled over the remote but real possibility that Imperial Order soldiers might be searching the woods for them. At the same time, he fretted about what could have killed all of Victor's men 
and might now be chasing them. He considered what other precautions he might take, and he deliberated over how he would fight whatever could have done such violence. Through it all, he kept trying to think of where Kalin might be. He went over everything he could remember. He brooded over whether or not she was hurt. He agonized over what he might have done wrong. He imagined that she must be filled with fear and doubt, wondering why he wasn't coming to help her escape, why he hadn't yet found her, and if he ever would before her captors killed her. He struggled to banish from his mind the gnawing fear that she might already be dead. He tried not to think about what might be done to her as a captive that could be infinitely more gruesome than a simple execution. Jagang had ample reason to want her to live a good long time. Only the living could feel pain. From the beginning, Kalin had been there to frustrate Jagang's ambitions and sometimes even reverse his success. The Imperial Order's very first expeditionary force in the New World, among other things, slaughtered all the inhabitants of the great Galean city of Ebenissia. Kalin came upon the grisly site shortly after a troop of young Galean recruits had discovered it. In their blind rage, despite being outnumbered ten to one, those young men had been bent on the glory of vengeance and victory on meeting upon the battlefield the soldiers who had tortured, raped, and murdered all of their loved ones. Kalin came across those recruits, led by Captain Bradley Ryan, just before they were about to march into a textbook battle that she realized would be their death. In their bold inexperience, they were convinced that they could make such tactics work and snatch victory despite being overwhelmingly outnumbered. Kalin knew how the experienced Imperial Order soldiers fought. She knew that if she allowed those young recruits to do as they planned, they would be marching into a merciless meat grinder, and all of them would die. The results of their short-sighted notions of the righteous glory of combat would be that those Imperial Order soldiers would then go on unopposed to other cities and continue to murder and plunder innocent people. Kalin took command of the young recruits and set about dissuading them of their ignorant notions of a fair fight. She brought them to fully understand that their only goal was killing the invaders. It didn't matter how the Galeans came to stand over the corpses of those brutes, it only mattered that they did. In that undertaking of killing, there was no glory, there was simply survival. They were killing so that there could be life. Kalin taught those recruits what they needed to know about fighting a force that greatly outnumbered them, and she shaped them into men who could accomplish the grim task. The night before leading those young men into combat, Kalin went alone into the enemy camp and killed their wizard, along with some of the officers. The next day, those 5,000 young men fought at her side, followed her instructions, learned from her, and along the way took terrible casualties. But they eventually killed every last one of the Imperial Order's 50,000-man advance force. It had been an accomplishment rarely equaled in history. That had been the first of many blows Kalin struck against Jagang. In answer, he sent assassins after her. They failed. In Richard's absence, after Nietzsche had taken him away to the heart of the old world, Kalin had gone to join Zed and the Daharan Empire forces. She found them dispirited and on the run after having lost a three-day battle. In Richard's place, carrying the Sword of Truth, the Mother Confessor pulled the army back onto its feet and immediately counterattacked, surprising the enemy and bloodying them. She brought backbone and fire to the Daharan forces. She inspired them to the challenge. Captain Ryan's men arrived to join with her in the fight against Jagang's invading horde. For nearly a year, Kalin led the Daharan Empire forces as they frustrated Jagang's efforts to swiftly subdue the New World. She harried and harassed him without pause. She helped direct plans that resulted in Jagang's army losing hundreds of thousands of men. Kalin had bled the Imperial Order army and helped grind them to a halt outside Aedendril. In winter, she had evacuated the people of Aedendril and had the army take them over the passes into Dahara. 
the Daharan forces then sealed off those passes and, for the time being, held the imperial order at bay, short of their final objective of conquering Dahara and finally bringing the new world under the brutal rule of the Fellowship of Order. Page 76. Jagang's hatred for Kalin was exceeded only by his hatred for Richard. Most recently, the Dreamwalker had sent an extremely dangerous wizard named Nicholas after them. Richard and Kalin had only narrowly escaped capture. Richard knew that the Order relished seeing to it that captured foes suffered monstrous abuse, and there was no one other than Richard whom Emperor Jigang wanted to put to torture more than the Mother Confessor. There were no lengths to which he would not go to get his hands on her. Emperor Jagang would reserve for Kalin the most unspeakable torture. Richard realized that he was standing frozen, trembling, his fingers gripping a fistful of balsam boughs. Kara silently watched him. He knelt and again started laying the branches in place while struggling to put terrible thoughts from his mind. Kara went back to her work. He put all his effort into concentrating on the task of completing their shelter. The sooner they got to sleep, the more rested they would be when they woke, and the faster they could travel. Even though they were nowhere near any roads and a great distance from the trails, Richard still didn't want to have a fire for fear that scouting soldiers might spot it. Although they wouldn't be able to see the fire's smoke through all the drizzle and fog, such weather tended to keep smoke low to the ground, drifting this way and that through the woods so any Imperial Order patrols would be able to smell it. It was a real enough possibility that none of the others argued for a fire. Being cold was a lot better than having to fight for their lives. Nietzsche dragged an armful of balsam boughs close as Richard continued to weave them up the lean-to. None of the others spoke, apparently absorbed in worry that whatever had killed the men might be out there among the deepening shadows, hunting the four of them as they prepared to go to sleep in a fortress made of nothing more than balsam boughs. Their first day's journey toward Alturang had felt less like traveling and more like running for their lives. But whatever had killed Victor's men had not chased them. At least Richard didn't think it had. He couldn't really imagine that whatever had the power to kill that many men in such a brutal fashion couldn't manage to catch up with them if it had their trail. Especially not something filled with a blood frenzy, as Nietzsche had described it. Besides, when he was in the woods, Richard usually knew when there were animals about and where they likely were, and as a rule, he knew when people were close. Had Victor and his men not been camped quite so far from Richard, Kalin, and Kara's camp, he would have known they were there. He also had a keen sense of when he was being pursued and if someone was following his trail. As a guide, he sometimes tracked people lost in the woods. He and other guides sometimes had contests to track one another. Richard knew how to watch for someone tracking him. This, however, was less a matter of suspecting that someone was following them, and more a feeling of icy dread, as if they were being chased by a murderous phantom in a blood frenzy. That fear constantly urged them to run. He knew, too, that running was often the trigger that made a predator pounce. Richard realized, though, that it was only his imagination making him feel the hot breath of pursuers. Zed had taught him that it was always important to understand why you had specific feelings so that you could decide if those feelings were caused by something that warranted attention or something that didn't. Other than the palpable fear caused by the brutality of the slaughter, Richard had no evidence that they were being chased, so he tried to keep the emotion in proper perspective. Fear itself often proved to be the greatest threat. Fear made people do thoughtless things that often got them into trouble. Fear made people stop thinking. When they stopped thinking, they often made foolish choices. Several times when he was growing up, Richard had tracked people who had gotten lost in the vast forests around Heartland. One boy Richard had tracked for two days kept running in the dark until he eventually fell from a cliff. Luckily, it wasn't a long fall. Richard found him at the bottom of the steep bank with a twisted ankle that was swollen but not broken. 
The boy was only cold, tired, and frightened. It could have been far worse, and he knew it. He had been very glad to see Richard appear and held him tightly around the neck all the way home. There were any number of ways to die out in the woods. Richard had heard of people attacked by a bear or a cougar or bitten by a snake, but he couldn't imagine what had killed Victor's men. He'd never seen anything like it. He knew it hadn't been soldiers. He supposed that it could have been the gifted, using some kind of terrible power to slaughter the men, but he just didn't think that was the explanation. He realized then that he was already thinking of it as a beast. Whatever killed the men, Richard had taken precautions as they had set out. He followed shallow streams until they were a good distance from the site of the slaughter. He was careful to lead them up out of the rushing water and away from the stream across ground where it would be much more difficult to track them. More than once throughout the day, he had led them over bare rock or through water to make it extremely time-consuming for someone good at tracking to follow them. The shelter, too, was designed to blend into the surrounding woods. It would be hard to spot unless someone passed very near to it. Victor dragged a heavy load of balsam boughs close and laid them at Richard's feet. Need more? With the toe of his boot, Richard nudged the pile, judging by its density how much and how well it would cover the remaining poles. No, I think these and the ones Nietzsche is bringing should be enough. Nietzsche dropped her load beside Victor's. It seemed odd to him seeing Nietzsche doing such work. Even dragging balsam boughs, she had a regal look about her. While Kara was a strikingly beautiful woman as well, her audacious bearing made it seem rather natural for her to be building a shelter, or a spiked flail cocked to kill intruders. Nietzsche, though, looked unnatural working in the woods, as if she would complain about getting her hands dirty, although she never once did. It wasn't that she was at all unwilling to do whatever Richard needed her to do. It was just that she looked completely out of place doing it. She simply had a noble bearing that seemed too stately for the task of hauling branches for a shelter in the woods. Now that she had brought all the balsam boughs that Richard needed, Nietzsche stood quietly under the dripping trees, hugging herself as she shivered. Richard's fingers were numb with cold as he quickly wove on the remaining boughs. He saw Kara as she worked to secure the limbs, occasionally putting her hands under her armpits. Only Victor showed no outward appearance of being cold. Richard imagined that the blacksmith's glower was enough to warm him most of the time. Why don't you three get some sleep, Victor said as Richard placed the last of the boughs over the shelter. I'll take watch for now if no one objects. I'm not much sleepy. From the undercurrent of anger in the man's voice, Richard imagined that Victor might not be sleepy for quite a long while. He could certainly understand Victor's bitter sorrow. The man would no doubt spend his watch trying to think of what he would say to Ferran's mother and the relatives of the other men. Richard laid an understanding hand on Victor's shoulder. We don't know what we're up against. Don't hesitate to wake us if you hear or see anything at all unusual. And don't forget to come inside and have your share of sleep. Tomorrow will be a long day of traveling. We all need to be strong. Victor nodded. Richard watched as the blacksmith picked up his cloak and threw it around his shoulders before seizing roots and clinging vines to help him scale the rock above the shelter to where he would watch over them. Richard wondered if perhaps the outcome might have been different had Victor been with the men. Then he thought about the aftermath of splintered trees, deep gouges in the ground carved with such force that it had overturned rocks and torn thick roots apart. He remembered the ripped leather armor, the shattered bones, the rent bodies, and was glad that Victor had not been with the men when the attack had come. Even a heavy mace wielded in anger by the powerful arms of the master blacksmith would not have stopped whatever had come into that clearing. Nietzsche pressed a hand to Richard's forehead, testing for fever. You need rest. No watch for you tonight. The three of us will each take a turn. Richard wanted to argue, but he knew that she was right. This was not a battle he should take up, so he didn't 
and instead nodded his agreement. Kara, obviously prepared to take Nietzsche's side if he argued, turned back from watching them from out of the small opening between the boughs. From the gathering darkness all around, a grating sound had begun to build into a shrill churr. Now that they were finished with the effort of building the shelter, the noise was hard to ignore. It made the whole forest seem alive with raucous activity. Nietzsche finally took notice of it and paused to look around. She frowned. What is that sound, anyway? Richard plucked an empty skin from a tree trunk. Everywhere throughout the forest, the trees were covered with the pale, tannish, thumb-sized husks. Cicadas, Richard smiled to himself as he let the gossamer ghost of the creature that had once lived inside roll into his palm. This is what's left after they molt. Nietzsche glanced at the empty skin in his hand and briefly looked at some of the others clinging to the trees. While I spent most of my life in towns and cities and indoors, I've spent a great deal of time outdoors since leaving the Palace of the Prophets. These insects must be unique to these woods. I don't recall ever seeing them before or hearing them. You wouldn't have. I was a boy the last time I saw them. This kind of cicada emerges from underground every 17 years. Today is the first day they all have begun to emerge. They will only be around for a few weeks while they mate and lay their eggs. Then we won't see them again for another 17 years. Really? Kara asked as she poked her head back out. Every 17 years? She thought it over for a moment and then scowled up at Richard. They better not keep us awake. Because of their numbers, they create quite an unforgettable sound. With countless of the cicadas all trilling together, you can sometimes hear the harmonic rise and fall of their song moving through the forest in a wave. In the quiet of night, their stridulation may seem deafening at first, but believe it or not, it will actually lull you to sleep. Satisfied to know that the noisy insects would not keep her charge awake, Kara disappeared back inside. Richard recalled his wonder when Zed had walked with him through the woods, showing him the newly emerged creatures, telling him all about their 17-year life cycle. To Richard, as a boy, it was a memorable wonder. Zed told him how he would be grown up when they came again, that he had first seen them as a boy, and the next time he would see them as a grown man. Richard remembered marveling at the event and promising himself that when they came again, he would be sure to spend more time watching the rare creatures when they appeared from the ground. Richard felt a wave of profound sadness for the loss of that innocent time in life. As a boy, the emergence of the cicadas had seemed like just about the most amazing phenomenon he could imagine, and waiting 17 years until they returned seemed like the hardest thing he would ever have to do. And now they were back. And now he was a man. He cast the empty husk aside. After Richard removed his wet cloak and crawled in behind Nietzsche, he pulled branches together to cover over the opening to the snug shelter. The thick branches toned down the high-pitched song of the cicadas. The ceaseless buzzing was making him sleepy. He was pleased to see that the balsam boughs worked to shed the rain leaving the cave-like refuge dry, if not warm. They had laid down a bed of boughs over the exposed ground so they would have a relatively soft and dry platform upon which to sleep. Even without rain dripping on them, though, the humidity and fog still dampened everything. Their breath came out in ephemeral clouds. Richard was weary of being wet. Handling trees had left him covered with bark and needles and dirt. His hands were sticky from tree sap. He couldn't remember ever being so miserable with grime and grit clinging to his wet skin and wet clothes. At least the pine and balsam pitch left the shelter smelling pleasant. He wished he could have a hot bath. He hoped that Kalin was warm and dry and unharmed. Tired as he was, and as sleepy as the sound of the cicadas was making him, there were things Richard needed to know. There were matters far more important to him than sleep or his simple boyhood wonder. He needed to find out what Nietzsche knew about what had killed Victor's men. 
There were too many connections to ignore. The attack had come right near where Richard, Kalin, and Kara had been camped a few days before. More importantly, whatever had killed the men didn't seem to have left any tracks, at least none that he had been able to find in his brief search. And other than that displaced rock, Richard couldn't find any tracks from either Kalin or her abductor. Richard intended, before he slept, to find out what Nietzsche knew about what had killed the men. Chapter 8 Richard untied the leather thongs beneath his pack and opened his bedroll, spreading it out in the narrow space left between the other two. Nietzsche, back at the place where the men were killed, you said that it had been a blood frenzy. He leaned back against the rock wall underneath the overhang. What did you mean? Nietzsche folded herself into a sitting position to his right atop her own bedroll. What we saw back there wasn't simply killing, isn't that obvious? He supposed she had a point. He had never witnessed a scene so shaped by rage. He was well aware, though, that she knew far more about it. Kara curled up to his left. I'm telling you, she said to Nietzsche, I don't think he knows. Richard cast a leery gaze at the moored Sith and then at the sorceress. Knows what? Nietzsche ran her fingers back through her wet hair, pulling strands off her face. She looked a bit puzzled. You said that you got the letter I sent. I did. It had been quite a while back. He tried to remember through the days of weariness and worry everything Nietzsche's letter had said. Something about Jagang creating weapons out of people. Your letter was valuable in helping figure out what was happening at the time. And I did appreciate your warning about Jagang's darker pursuits of creating weapons out of the gifted. Nicholas the Slide was as nasty a piece of work. Nicholas. Nietzsche spat the name before wrapping a blanket around her shoulders. He is but a flea on the rump of the wolf. If Nicholas was the flea, Richard hoped never to run into the wolf. Nicholas the Slide had been a wizard whom the Sisters of the Dark had altered to have abilities that were well beyond any human traits. It had been thought that accomplishing such conjuring with people was not only a lost art, but impossible, because, among other things, such nefarious work required the use of not only additive, but subtractive magic. While a rare few had learned to manipulate it, until Richard's birth, there hadn't been anyone born with the actual gift for subtractive magic in thousands of years. But there had been those who, even though they had not been born with that side of the gift, still had managed to gain the use of subtractive magic. Darkin Rall had been one such person. It was said that he had traded the pure souls of children to the keeper of the underworld in exchange for dark indulgences, including the ability to use subtractive magic. Richard supposed that it could also have been through morbid promises to the Keeper that the First Sisters of the Dark had contrived to obtain the knowledge of how to use subtractive magic, thereafter passing it on in secret to their covert disciples. When the Palace of the Prophets had fallen, Jagang had captured many of the Sisters, both Sisters of the Light and Sisters of the Dark, but their numbers were dwindling. From what Richard had learned, the Dreamwalker's ability enabled him to enter every part of a person's mind and thereby control them. There was no private thought he did not know, or intimate deed he could not witness. It was an inner violation so complete that no hidden corner of the mind was safe from the Dreamwalker's direct scrutiny. What was worse, the victim could not always tell if Jagang was lurking there, in their mind, witness to their most secret thoughts. Nietzsche had said that the haunting possession by the Dreamwalker had driven a few of the sisters mad. Richard also knew that through that link, Jagang could measure out excruciating pain, and if he wished it, death. With such control, the Dreamwalker could make the sisters do anything he wished. Through an ancient magic created by one of Richard's ancestors to protect his people from the Dreamwalkers of that time, those who swore fidelity to the Lord Rahl were protected. Along with the rest of his gift, Richard had inherited that bond, and, with the Dreamwalker again born into the world, 
it now safeguarded those loyal to him from Jagang stealing into their minds and enslaving them. While a formal devotion was spoken by the people of Dahara to their Lord Rao, the protection that the bond provided was actually invoked through the conviction of the person bonded, through their doing what they thought was called for by their fidelity. Both Anne, the prelate of the Sisters of the Light, and Verna, the woman Anne had named as her successor, had stolen into the Imperial Order's camp and tried to rescue their sisters. The captive sisters had been offered the protection of the bond. All they had to do was accept in their hearts their loyalty to Richard, but most were so terrified of Jagang that more than once they had refused their chance at freedom. Not everyone was willing to embrace liberty. Liberty required not just effort, but risk. Some people chose to delude themselves and see their chains as protective armor. Nietzsche had once been in servitude to the Fellowship of Order, the Sisters of the Light, and then the Sisters of the Dark, and finally to Jagang. She no longer was. She had instead embraced Richard's love of life. Her steadfast loyalty to him and what he believed in had freed her from the clutches of the Dreamwalker, but far more than that, it had freed her from the yoke of servitude she had worn her whole life. Her life was now hers alone. He thought that maybe that might have something to do with the resolute nobility of her bearing. I didn't read the whole letter, Richard admitted. Before I was able to finish it, we were attacked by men that Nicholas had sent to capture us. I told you about it before. That was when Sabar was killed. During that fight, the letter fell into the fire. Nietzsche slouched back. Dear spirits, she murmured, I thought you knew. Richard was tired and at the end of his patience. Knew what? Nietzsche let her arms slip to her sides. She looked up at him in the dim light, and let out a frazzled sigh. Chagang found a way for the Sisters of the Dark he holds captive to use their ability to begin creating weapons out of people, as had been done during the Great War. In many ways, he is a brilliant man. He makes it his business to learn. He collects books from the places he sacks. I've seen some of those books. Among all sorts of tomes, he has ancient handbooks of magic from around the time of the Great War. The problem is, while he may be a dreamwalker and brilliant in certain areas, he does not have the gift, and so his understanding of it, of exactly what Han is and how this force of life functions, is crude at best. It's not easy for one without magic to comprehend such things. You have the gift, and yet even you don't really understand it or know very much about how it works. But because Jagang doesn't know how to work magic, he blunders around demanding that things be done simply because he has dreamed them up, because he is the great emperor and he wishes his visions to be brought to life. Richard rubbed his fingers back and forth on his brow, rolling off the dirt. Don't sell him short in that regard. It's possible that he knows more about what he's doing than you realize. What do you mean? I may not know a lot about the subject of magic, but one of the things I have learned is that magic can also be thought of much like an art form. Through artistic expression, for lack of a better term, magic that has never been before can be created. Nietzsche stared in astonished disbelief. Richard, I don't know where you could have heard such a thing, but it just doesn't work that way. I know, I know. Kalen thinks I'm out on a limb with this, too. Having been raised around wizards, she knows a lot about magic, and in the past she has flatly insisted that I'm wrong. But I'm not. I've done it before. Using the gift in such a way, in new and original ways, got me out of what would otherwise have been unbreakable traps. Nietzsche was peering at him in that analytical way of hers. He suddenly realized why. It wasn't only what he'd said about magic. He was talking about Kalen again the woman who did not exist, the woman he had dreamed. Kara's expression betrayed her mute concern. Anyway, Richard said, getting back to the crux of the matter, just because Jagang doesn't have the gift doesn't mean he can't still dream up things, dream up nightmares, like Nicholas. It is through such original conceptualization that the most deadly things for which there may be no conventional counter are created. 
I suspect that this may have been the method those wizards in ancient times used for creating weapons out of people in the first place. Nietzsche was beside herself with bottled agitation. Richard, magic just doesn't work like that. You can't dream up whatever you'd like to have, wish for what you want. Magic functions by the laws of its nature, just like all other things in the world. Whim will not make boards out of trees. You must cut the tree to the desired form. If you want a house, you can't wish up bricks and boards to stack themselves into a dwelling. You must use your hands to craft the structure. Richard leaned toward the sorceress. Yes, but it's the human imagination that makes those concrete actions not just possible, but effective. Most builders think in terms of houses or barns. They do what's been done before simply because that was what was done before. Much of the time, they don't want to think, so they never envision anything more. They limit themselves to repetition, and as an excuse, they insist that it must be done that way because it has always been done that way. Most magic is like that, the gifted simply repeating what has already been done before, believing that it must be done that way with no more justification than that it has always been done that way. Before a grand palace can be built, it first has to be imagined by someone bold enough to have a vision of what could be. A palace will not spontaneously spring forth to the surprise of all while men are attempting to build a barn. Only the conscious act of conceptualization can bring about the reality. For that act of creative imagination to bring about the existence of a palace, it cannot violate any of the laws of the nature of the things that are used. On the contrary, the person who imagines a grand palace with the goal of seeing it built must be intimately aware of the nature of all the things he will use in the construction. If he isn't, the palace will fall down. He must know the nature of the materials better than the man who uses them to build a simple barn. It's not a matter of wishing for something that transcends the laws of nature, but a matter of original thinking based on those laws of nature. I grew up in the woods around Heartland, never having seen a palace. Richard spread his arms as if to show her the things he had seen since leaving his homeland. Until I saw the castle at Tamarang, the wizard's keep, and the confessor's palace in Aidendril, or the people's palace in Dahara, I never imagined that such places existed, or even that they could exist. They were beyond the scope of my thinking at the time. And yet, even though I never imagined that such places could be built, other men thought them up and they were built. I think that one of the important functions of grand creations is that they inspire people. Nietzsche appeared not only to be swept up in his explanation, but to be considering his words with serious interest. Do you mean to say then, that you think an art form can also shape such important things as the function of magic? Richard smiled. Nietzsche, you could not grasp the importance of life until I carved the statue back in Alturang. When you saw the concept in tangible form, you were able at last to put together all the things you had learned throughout your life and finally grasp its meaning. An artistic creation touched your soul. That's what I mean about an important function of great works, is that they inspire people. Because it inspired you with the beauty of life, with the nobility of man, you acted to become free, something you had never thought was possible. Because the people of Alturang as well could see in that statue what could and should be, they were stirred to stand up to the tyranny crushing their lives. It was not accomplished by copying other statues, by doing what was the accepted norm for statues in the old world of showing man as weak and ineffective, but by an idea of beauty, a vision of nobility that shaped what I carved. I didn't violate the nature of the marble I used, but rather I used the nature of the stone to accomplish something different than what others routinely did with it. I studied the properties of stone, I learned how to work it, and I sought to understand what more I could do with it in order to bring about my objective. I had Victor make me the finest tools that would enable me to do the work in the way it needed to be done. In that way, I brought to reality what I wanted to create, what had never been done before. I think that magic can work this way as well. 
I believe that such original ideas played a part in how weapons were once created out of people. After all, when such weapons were made, they were effective in large part because they were original, because they had never been thought of or seen before. In many instances, the other side in the war then had to work to create entirely new things out of magic that were able to counter those weapons. In many cases, they were able to render the weapon obsolete by creating a counter magic. And then someone on the other side immediately went to work thinking up some new horror. If using magic creatively was not possible, then how did the wizards of old create weapons with it? You can't say they simply got the knowledge from a book or from past experience. Where and how would the first such weapons have originated if not with an original idea? Someone had to have used magic creatively in the first place. I think that Jagang is again doing this very thing with magic. He has studied some of what was done in the Great War, what weapons were created, and learned from that. He sometimes may direct that what was once created to be created again, such as with Nicholas. But in other instances, I think he imagines what has never been, what goes beyond what has been done before, and has it brought to reality by those who know how to use magic to build what he wants. In these acts of creation, it isn't the work that is the most remarkable aspect, but the idea and vision that makes the labor effective. Just as carpenters and bricklayers who built houses and barns can be employed to construct a palace. It wasn't so much their labor that was remarkable in the creation of palaces, but the act of insight and creation that gave it direction. Nietzsche nodded ever so slightly in concentration as she weighed his words. I can see that your notion isn't at all the wild idea I thought it was at first. This is a line of reasoning that I've never encountered. I'll have to think about the possibilities. You may be the first to really understand the mechanism behind Jagang's scheme, or for that matter, behind the creations of wizards in ancient times. This would explain a great many things that have nagged at me over the years. Nietzsche's words were spoken with intellectual respect for a concept new to her, but a concept she fully grasped. No one who had ever spoken to Richard about magic had ever treated his ideas with such an insightful understanding. He felt as if this was the first time anyone had truly understood what he saw. Well, he said, I've had to deal with Jagang's creations. Like I said, Nicholas was a great deal of trouble. In the dim light, Nietzsche studied his face for a moment. Richard, from what I was able to find out, she said in a soft voice, Nicholas was not Jagang's actual goal. Nicholas was merely practice. Practice? Richard thumped his head back against the wall. I don't know, Nietzsche. I'm not so sure about that. Nicholas the Slide was a formidable creation and one nasty piece of work. You don't know the trouble he caused us. Nietzsche shrugged. You defeated him? Richard blinked in astonishment. You make it sound like he was just a bump in the road. He wasn't. I'm telling you, he was a frightening creation who nearly killed us. Nietzsche slowly shook her head. And I'm telling you, as formidable as he may have been, Nicholas was not what your gang was after. You told me not to sell the Dreamwalker short. Don't you now do the same thing? He never thought Nicholas was fully your match. What you say about the process of imagination in creating new things actually makes sense, especially in this instance. It may even explain a few things. From the little I was able to learn, I believe that from the beginning, Nicholas was only meant to expand the skills of the sisters that Jagang had assigned to the task of creating weapons. Nicholas was not Jagang's objective, but simply practice on the way to that objective. With his dwindling number of sisters, that practice has gained a new urgency. Even so, he apparently has enough sisters for the work of creating his weapons. Richard felt goosebumps tingling up his arms as he began to realize the full implications of what Nietzsche was telling him. You mean to say that in creating Nicholas, it was like Jagang was just having his carpenters build a house as practice before he sends them on to build something vastly more complicated like a palace? Nietzsche looked up at him and smiled. Yes, that's it exactly. 
but he sent Nicholas with troops to govern a land as well as to capture us. A mere matter of convenience. Jagang had instilled in Nicholas a need to hunt you, but only as part of the testing for his greater goals. He didn't really expect the slide to be able to accomplish his transcendent ambitions. The emperor may hate you for impeding his progress in conquering the new world. He may consider you unworthy as an opponent, and he may deem you an immoral heathen worthy only of death, but he's smart enough to give you credit for your ability. It's like when you said that you sent that captured soldier to assassinate your gang. You didn't really expect that lone soldier to succeed at the difficult task of assassinating a well-guarded emperor. But the soldier was of no other value to you, and since you thought that there was at least a chance that he might accomplish something, you might as well send him on the mission while you worked on far better ideas that you expected to have a more reasonable chance of success. And if the soldier was killed, then that was fine by you because he only got what was coming to him anyway. Nicholas was like that. He was a conjured creation, practice along the path to something altogether superior. In the scheme of things, Nicholas wasn't all that valuable to Jagang, so Jagang, instead of having him killed, used him. If Nicholas succeeded, then Jagang would be ahead of the game, and if you killed him, then you did him a service. Richard ran his hand back over his hair. He felt overwhelmed at the implications. He had criticized Nietzsche for not being open to seeing the larger picture, and here he had just been guilty of doing the same thing. Well then, he asked her, what do you think Jagang might conjure up that's worse than Nicholas the Slide? The drone of the cicadas seemed oppressive, invasive at that moment, as if they were the enemy surrounding him. I believe he has forged ahead and already created such a masterwork, Nietzsche said with quiet finality. She pulled her blanket up around her shoulders and held it closed at her throat. I think that's what those men back there in the woods face. Richard watched her expression in the near darkness. What do you know about what Jagang has done? Not a great deal, Nietzsche admitted. Only a few words whispered as one of my former fellow sisters was leaving on a journey. A journey? To the world of the dead. By her tone of voice and the way she stared off, Richard didn't want to ask what had brought about the woman's travel plans. So, what did she tell you? Nietzsche let out a weary sigh. That your gang had been making things from the lives of captives and volunteers both. Some of those young wizards actually think they are sacrificing themselves for a greater good. Nietzsche shook her head at such a sad delusion. The sister was the one who told me that Nicholas was but a stepping stone to His Excellency's true and noble ends. Nietzsche looked up again to make sure that Richard was paying attention. She said that Jagang was on the brink of creating a creature similar to one he had found in ancient writings, but far better, far more deadly and invincible. The hair at the back of Richard's neck lifted. A creature? What kind of creature? A beast. An invincible beast. Richard swallowed at the baleful sound of the word. What's this creature do? Were you able to find out? What's its nature? For some reason, he just couldn't seem to bring himself to use the same word aloud right then, as if speaking it might summon it from out of the surrounding night. Nietzsche's troubled eyes turned away. As the sister slipped into the arms of death, she smiled like the keeper himself with a booty of souls and said, once he uses his power, the beast will at last know Richard Rawl then it will find him and kill him. His life, like mine, is finally at its end. Richard made himself blink. Did she say anything else? Nietzsche shook her head. At that point, she convulsed in the agony of death. The room went black as the keeper snatched her soul in payment for bargains she had once struck. The one thing that's been troubling me is how this creature found us. Still, I don't think the situation is as desperate as it may seem. 
There is really no conclusive evidence to make us believe that it really was this beast that attacked the men back there. After all, you haven't used your power, so there wouldn't have been any way for Jagang's beast to find you. Richard looked down at his boots. When the soldiers attacked, he said in a low voice as he rubbed a finger along the edge of the leather sole, I used my gift to deflect the arrows. I didn't do so well with the last one. Lord Rall, Kara said. I don't think that's true. I think you used your sword to deflect the arrows. You weren't there right then, so you didn't see what was happening, Richard said as he grimly shook his head. I was using my sword on the soldiers. I couldn't use it to deflect the dozens of arrows as well. I deflected the arrows with my gift. Nietzsche was now sitting up straight. You used your gift? How did you summon it? Richard shrugged self-consciously. He wished he knew more about what he'd done. Through need, I guess. I didn't know I would end up being responsible. She gently touched his arm. Don't foolishly blame yourself. You had no way to know. Had you not done as you did, you would have been killed. You are acting to save your life. You didn't know anything about the beast. More than that, though, you may not be entirely responsible. Richard frowned at her. What do you mean? Nietzsche sank back against the rock wall. I fear that I may have contributed to its finding us. You? But how? I used subtractive magic to get rid of your blood so I could heal you. While the sister didn't say anything specific that I could point to, I still got the uneasy feeling that this creature may somehow be tied to the underworld. If that's true, then when I got rid of your blood with the use of subtractive magic, I may have inadvertently given it a taste of your blood, so to speak. You did the right thing, Kara said. You did the only thing you could do. To let Lord Rao die instead would have been handing Jagang what he sought. Nietzsche nodded her appreciation of Kara's words. Richard let out the breath he had been holding. What else can you tell me about this thing? Nothing of any consequence, I'm afraid. The sister told me that the sisters who were experimenting with creating weapons out of people had only created Nicholas to work out some of the preliminary details before moving on to their important work. Even so, some of them died in the task of conjuring the slide. And with as many as have already died, Jagang is getting to the point where he has few to spare. He has used those he still has, while he still has enough, to accomplish his goal. Apparently creating the beast was vastly more complex and difficult than creating a slide, but the results were said to have been worth it. I suspect that along the way he may have directed that shortcuts be taken, shortcuts that involve the underworld. If we're going to fight this thing, we need to find out everything we can about this beast. And we need to find out before it catches us. With what happened to the men, I don't think we have much time. Richard knew that what she meant, but hadn't said, was that she wanted him to forget what she thought were his meaningless dreams about Kalin, and to put his full concentration and effort toward this dangerous creation of Jagang's. I have to find Kalin, he said in a quiet tone, meant to convey his conviction and his resolve. You can't do anything if you're dead, Nietzsche said. Richard lifted the baldric over his head. He leaned the polished scabbard holding the sword of truth against the rock. Look, we're not even sure that whatever killed those men back there really is this beast you're talking about. What do you mean? Nietzsche asked. Well, if it can find me when I use my gift, then why did it attack the men? Sure, it was the place where I'd used my ability, but the attack was three days after the fact. If it was supposed to know me after I used my power, then why attack the men? Maybe it just thought you were among them, Kara offered. Nietzsche nodded. Kara may be right. Maybe, Richard said. But if it recognized me by me using my gift, and in addition you gave it a taste of my blood, then wouldn't it know that I wasn't among the men? Nietzsche shrugged. I don't know. It very well could be that by using your gift, you only summoned it to the general area. But when you stopped using your ability, 
then the beast was blind to you, so to speak. Maybe it was so angry that it just missed you, it went into a frenzy of killing whoever was there. If that's true, then I would suspect that it needs you to again use your gift, now that it's close, to finally be able to catch you. But she said that once I used my gift, it would know me. That doesn't sound to me like I need to use it again for it to find me. Maybe it does now know you, Nietzsche said, but maybe it still needs to find you. Since it knows you now, maybe all the beast needs is for you to again use your gift so that it can pounce. That had a frightening kind of logic to it. I guess it's good that I don't depend on my gift. You'd better make sure you let us protect you, Kara said. I don't think you had better do anything that might even inadvertently cause you to use your magic. I'm afraid that I agree with Kara, Nietzsche said. I'm not sure about it having a taste of your blood, but the one thing we do know for sure is what the sister told me, that if you use your gift, it will find you. As long as the beast is hunting you, and until we can learn more about it and nullify the threat, you must not use your gift for any reason. Richard conceded with a nod. He didn't know if that was possible. While he didn't know how to call upon his gift, he wasn't sure that he knew how to prevent it coming forth either. It was awakened by anger and answered a certain kind of need. He wasn't aware of the specific conditions that invoked his ability, it just happened. While their theory of not using his gift made sense, he wasn't sure he could actually control it enough to prevent it if conditions caused it to spring to life. Another frightening thought occurred to him. It was possible that the beast had found him and knew precisely where he was, and it had only killed the men out of bloodlust. For all he knew, the beast could be out in the woods watching, using the noise of the cicadas to cover its footsteps as it approached their shelter. In the dim light, Nietzsche watched him. As he pondered the grim possibilities, she reached out again and felt his forehead. Drawing back, she said, We'd better get some rest. You're shivering with the cold. I'm afraid that in your condition you may lapse into a fever. Lie down. We'll all have to keep each other warm. But first, you need to be dry or you'll never get warm. Kara leaned past Richard toward Nietzsche. How do you think you can get him dry without a fire? Nietzsche gestured. Both of you, lie back. Richard lay back. Kara hesitantly complied. Nietzsche leaned over them, placing a hand just above their heads. Richard felt the warm tingle of magic, but not an uncomfortable sensation like the last time. He could see the soft glow above Kara as well. It struck him how remarkable it was for Nietzsche to trust Kara enough to use magic on her. Using magic on a moored Sith gave them the opportunity to seize that magic in order to control the gifted person. Richard found it even more remarkable that Kara would trust Nietzsche enough to allow her to use magic on her. Mord Sith did not like magic one bit. Nietzsche's hands moved slowly downward, just above their bodies. By the time she reached Richard's boots, he realized that he felt dry. He ran a hand over his shirt, then his pants, and found that both were dry. How is that? Nietzsche asked. Kara was scowling. I'd rather be wet. Nietzsche arched an eyebrow. I can arrange that if you like. Kara put her hands under her arms to warm them and remained silent. Satisfied that Richard was pleased, Nietzsche did the same for herself, moving both hands down her dress as if slowly pressing away the water. When she finished, she was shivering and her teeth were chattering, but she and her black dress were dry. Concerned by the way she wavered that she might pass out, Richard sat up and gently gripped her arm. Are you all right? I'm just exhausted she admitted. I have not had much sleep for days, on top of the effort of healing you and then the exertion of the traveling we did after the attack today. I'm afraid that it's all caught up with me. This bit of magic took what strength and warmth I had left. I just need to get some sleep, that's all. But even if you don't realize it, Richard, you need it even more. Lie back and sleep now, please. If we all lie close, we can keep each other warm. Dry but weary and still cold, 
Richard wriggled into his bedroll. She was right. He did need rest. He couldn't get help for Kalen if he wasn't rested. Without hesitation, Kara pressed up close on his left to help get him warm. Nietzsche pushed in on his other side. The warmth was a relief. He hadn't realized how cold he was until the three of them crowded in tight together. He knew by now he felt that Nietzsche was right, that he wasn't fully well yet. At least he only needed rest and not magic. Do you think this beast could have taken Kalin in order to get to me? He asked into the dark and quiet shelter. Nietzsche was a moment in answering. Such a creature needs no perverse method to get to you, Richard. From what the sister said and from what I fear I may have done, to say nothing of you having used your gift, the beast will be able to find you. From all those dead men back there, I fear it already has. Richard felt the weight of guilt crush down upon him. If not for him, those men would be alive. He had difficulty swallowing past the lump in his throat. He wished there were some way to undo what was done, some way to give them their lives and their futures back. Lord Rao, Kara whispered, I would like to make a confession if you will swear never to repeat it. Richard had never heard her say such an odd thing. All right. What is it that you wish to confess? Her answer was a while in coming, and then it was so soft he would not have been able to hear it were she not so close. I'm afraid. Almost against his better judgment, Richard lifted his arm around her shoulders and held her close. Don't be. It's coming after me, not you. She lifted her head and scowled at him. That is the reason I'm afraid. After seeing what it did to those men, I'm afraid that it's coming for you and there is nothing I can do to protect you. Oh. Richard said. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I'm afraid of that too. Kara laid her head back down on his shoulder, content to stay under the protective comfort of his arm. The surrounding strum of the cicadas somehow made him feel more vulnerable. The 17-year cycle of the insects was inescapable, inexorable, unstoppable. So was Jagang's beast. How could he hide from such a thing? So... Nietzsche asked, apparently trying to lighten the somber mood in the shelter. Where did you meet this woman of your dreams? Richard didn't know if she was trying to soften the question with a little humor, or if she was being sarcastic. If he didn't know better, he would have thought it sounded like jealousy. He stared up in the darkness as he thought back to that day. I was out in the woods looking for evidence of who had killed my father, the man I grew up thinking was my father, George Cipher, the man who'd raised me. That was when I spotted Kalen moving along a trail around Trunt Lake. Four men were following her. They were assassins sent by Dark and Rawl to kill her. He had already killed all the other confessors. She is the last. So you rescued her? Kara asked. I helped her. Together we were able to kill the assassins. She'd come to Westland looking for a long-lost wizard. It turned out that Zed was the great wizard she had been sent to find. He still held the position of first wizard, even though he had given up the Midlands and fled to Westland before I was born. The whole time I grew up, I never knew that Zed was a wizard or my grandfather. I only knew him as my best friend in the world. He could sense Nietzsche looking at him and feel her warm, soft breath against the side of his face. Why did she want this great wizard? Dark and Rawl had put the boxes of Orden in play. It was everyone's worst nightmare. Richard clearly recalled his dread at hearing that news. He had to be stopped before he opened the correct box. Kalin had been sent to ask this long-vanished first wizard to appoint a seeker. After that first day when I saw her by Trunt Lake, my life was never again the same. Into the silence, Kara asked, So, was it love at first sight? They were humoring him, trying to take his thoughts off the men who had been slaughtered by a beast sent by Jagang to kill him, trying to take his mind off the monster now coming for him. The thought struck him that maybe somewhere back in the woods around where they had camped, somewhere in an undiscovered place where he hadn't looked, lay Kalin's torn remains. 
Such a thought was so painful to contemplate that it felt like it was crushing his heart. Richard didn't reach up and wipe away the tear that ran down his cheek, but with a gentle touch, Nietzsche did. Her hand briefly, tenderly caressed his cheek. I think we'd better try to get some sleep, he said. Nietzsche drew back her hand and laid her head against his arm. In the darkness, Richard couldn't seem to make his burning eyes close. Before long, he could hear Kara's even breathing as she surrendered to sleep. Nietzsche softly pressed her cheek against his shoulder as she snugged up close in their shared warmth. Nietzsche, he whispered. Yes. What kind of torture does Jagang use on captives? He could feel Nietzsche take a deep breath and let it out slowly. Richard, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm sure you have to know that Jagang is a man who needs killing. Richard had had to ask the question. He was relieved that Nietzsche was kind enough not to answer it. When Zed first gave me the sword, I told him that I would not be an assassin. I have since come to understand the principled value of preserving life through the task of killing evil men. I wish that driving the Imperial Order out of the New World was as simple as killing Jagang. I can't tell you how many times I wished I had killed him when I had the chance, even though you are right about it not ending the war. I wish I could stop thinking about all the opportunities I missed. I wish I could stop thinking about all the things I should have done. Richard reached around her and held her trembling shoulders. He felt her muscles slowly relax. Her breathing finally slowed as she slipped into sleep. If he was to find Kalin, Richard had to get the rest he needed. He closed his eyes as another tear leaked out. He missed her so much. His thoughts lingered on that first day he saw Kalin in the white, satiny smooth dress that he only much later found out distinguished her as the mother confessor. He remembered the way it hugged her shape, the way it made her look so noble. He remembered the way her long hair cascaded down around her shoulders framing her in the dappled forest light. He remembered looking into her beautiful green eyes and seeing the gleam of intelligence looking back at him. He remembered feeling from that first instant, from that first shared gaze, as if he had always known her. He told her that there were four men following her. She asked, Do you choose to help me? Before his mind could form a thought, he heard himself say, Yes. He had never for an instant been sorry that he said yes. She needed help now. His last thoughts as he drifted into tormented sleep were of Kalin. Chapter 9 Anne hurriedly hung the simple tin lantern on the hook outside the door. She focused her Han into a bud of heat, and it bloomed into a small flame in the air above her upturned palm. As she stepped into the small room, she gently sent the little flame flitting onto the wick of a candle on the table. As the candle came to life, she closed the door. It had been quite a while since she had received a message in her journey book. She was impatient to get to it. The room was sparse. The plain, plastered walls had no windows. A small table and a straight-backed wooden chair that she had asked to have brought in almost filled the space not used by the bed. Besides its use as a bedroom, the room also made a suitable sanctuary, a place where Anne could be alone, where she could think, reflect, and pray. It also provided privacy for when she used the journey book. A small plate of cheese and sliced fruit sat waiting for her on the table. Jensen had probably left the plate before going off with Tom to stare at the moon. No matter how old Anne got, it invariably brought her a sense of warm inner satisfaction when she saw that look of love in a couple's eyes. They always seemed to think they did a fine job of hiding their feelings from others, but, as obvious as it usually was, they might as well be painted purple. At times, Anne privately regretted that she had never had a time like that with Nathan, 
a time to indulge in complete, simple, extravagant attraction. Expressions of feelings, though, were deemed unbecoming for the prelate. Anne paused. She wondered exactly where she had come to have such a belief. When she had been a novice, they didn't exactly hold classes in which they said, should you ever be appointed prelate, you must always mask your feelings. Except disapproval, of course. A good prelate, with no more than a look, was supposed to be capable of making people's knees tremble uncontrollably. She didn't know where she had learned that either, but she had always seemed to have had the knack. Maybe all along it had been the Creator's plan for her to be the prelate, and he had given her the appropriate disposition for the job. How she sometimes missed it. More than that, though, she had never allowed herself to consciously consider her feelings for Nathan. He was a prophet. When she was prelate of the Sisters of the Light and sovereign authority at the Palace of the Prophets, he had been her prisoner, although they dressed it up in less harsh terms, trying to put a more humane face on it, but it had been no more complicated than that. It had always been believed that prophets were too dangerous to be allowed to run free in the world among normal people. In confining him from a young age, they had denied the existence of free will, preordaining that he would cause harm even though he would never be given the chance to make a conscious choice in his own actions. They had pronounced him guilty without benefit of a crime, it had been an archaic and irrational belief that Anne had unthinkingly adhered to for most of her life. At times, she didn't like considering what that said about her. Now that she and Nathan were both old and found themselves together, however improbable that might have seemed at one time, their relationship could not be described as extravagant attraction. Indeed, she had spent the vast majority of her life enduring her displeasure with the man's antics and seeing to it that he never escaped either his collar or his confinement in the palace, thereby ensuring his intractable behavior, thereby incurring the ire of the sisters, which made him more unruly yet, round and round in a circle. No matter the uproar he had been able to ignite seemingly at will, there had always been something about the man that made Anne smile inwardly. At times he was like a child, a child who was nearly a thousand years old, a child who was a wizard, a child who carried the gift for prophecy. A prophet had but to open his mouth, but to utter prophecy to the uneducated masses, and it would ignite riots at the least, war at the worst. At least that had always been the fear. Although she was hungry, Anne pushed the plate of cheese and fruit aside. It could wait. Her heart fluttered with the anticipation of what news the message from Verna might bring. Anne sat and scooted her chair close to the simple wooden table. She pulled out the little leather-covered journey book and thumbed through the pages until she again spotted the writing. The room was small and dark. She squinted to help her better make out the words. She finally had to pull the fat candle a little closer. My dearest Anne, began the message from Verna written in the book, I hope this finds you and the prophet well. I know you said that Nathan was proving to be a valuable contribution to our cause, but I still worry about you being with that man. I hope his cooperation hasn't soured since last I heard from you. I admit to having difficulty imagining him being cooperative without a collar around his neck. I hope you are being cautious. I've never known the prophet to be entirely sincere, especially when he smiles. Anne had to smile herself. She understood all too well. But Verna didn't know Nathan the way Anne did. He could sometimes get them into trouble faster than ten boys bringing frogs to dinner, and yet, after all was said and done, after so many centuries knowing the prophet, there really wasn't anyone with whom she had more in common. Anne sighed and turned her attention back to the message in the journey book. We have been quite busy warding off Jagang's siege of the passes into Dahara, Verna wrote, but at least we have been successful, perhaps too successful. If you are there, prelate, please answer. Anne frowned. 
how could one be too successful in keeping marauding hordes from overrunning your defenses, slaughtering your defenders, and enslaving a free people? She impatiently pulled the candle closer still. In truth, she was quite jumpy over what Jagang was up to now that winter had ended and the spring mud was past. The Dreamwalker was a patient foe. His men were from far to the south in the old world and weren't used to the winters up north in the new world. While many had fallen victim to the harsh conditions, vast numbers died of the diseases that swept through his winter encampment. Despite losing men in battles to sickness and by a variety of other causes, more of the invaders poured north all the time so that despite everything, Jagang's army inexorably continued to grow. Even so, the man did not waste any of his vast numbers in pointless and futile winter campaigns. He didn't care about the lives of his soldiers, but he did care about conquering the new world, so he only moved when the weather was not a factor. Jagang did not take risks he didn't need to. He simply, steadily, resolutely ground his enemies to dust. Bringing the world to heel was all that mattered to him, not how long it took. He viewed the world of life through the prism of the beliefs of the Fellowship of Order. Individual life, including his, was of no importance. Only the contribution that a person's life could make to the Order was meaningful. With such a vast army in the New World, the forces of the Daharan Empire were now at the mercy of what the Dreamwalker did next. To be sure, the Daharan forces were formidable, but they certainly weren't enough to withstand, much less turn back, the full weight of the seemingly endless numbers of Imperial Order troops. At least not until Richard did whatever he could to effect some change in the tide of war. Prophecy said that Richard was the pebble in the pond, meaning that he caused ripples that spread through everything, affected everything. Prophecy also said, in many different ways and in many different texts, that only if Richard led them in the final battle did they have a chance to triumph. If he didn't guide them in that final battle, prophecy was clear and unambiguous. It said that all would be lost. Anne pressed her fist against the queasy pain in the pit of her stomach and then pulled the stylus from the spine of the book that was the twin to the one Verna had. I am here, Verna, she wrote, but you are the prelate now. The prophet and I are long dead and buried. It was a deception that had enabled the two of them to save a great many lives. There were times when Anne missed being prelate and missed her flock of sisters. She had dearly loved many of them, at least the ones who hadn't ended up being in truth sisters of the dark. The burning pain of that betrayal not just of her, but of the Creator, never eased. Still, being free of such towering responsibility left her better able to put her mind to other more important work. While she hated having lost her old way of life, of being prelate and running the Palace of the Prophets, her calling was to a higher purpose. Not to stone walls and the administration of an entire palace of sisters, novices, and young wizards in training. Her true calling was helping to preserve the world of life. In order for her to do that, it was better that the Sisters of the Light and everyone else believed her and Nathan dead. Anne sat up straighter when Verna's writing began appearing across the page. Anne, I am comforted to have you back with me, if only in the journey book. There are so few of us left. I confess that sometimes I long for the days of peace back at the palace the times when everything seemed to be so much easier and to make so much more sense, and I only thought it was all so difficult. The world certainly has changed since Richard was born. Anne couldn't argue with that. She popped a piece of cheese in her mouth and then leaned in and began writing. I pray every day that such order and peace can again settle over the world and we can go back to complaining about the weather. Verna, I am confused. What did you mean when you said that perhaps you were too successful in defending the passes? Please explain. I await your reply. Anne leaned back in her straight-backed chair and chewed a slice of pear as she waited. 
Since her journey book was twinned with the one Verna had, anything written in one appeared at the same time in the other. It was one of the few ancient items of magic left from the Palace of the Prophets. Verna's words again began moving across the blank page. Our scouts and trackers report that Jagang has begun his move. Because he has not been able to break through the passes, the Emperor has split his forces and is taking an army south. General Meifert had been fearing that he would do something like this. It's not hard to guess his strategy. Jagang undoubtedly plans to take a large force of his troops down through the Kern Valley and then south around the mountains. Once he finally is clear of all the barriers, he will swing around into the southern reaches of Dahara and then head north. This is the worst possible news for us. We can't abandon the protection of the passes, not while part of his army lies in wait on the other side. And yet, we cannot allow Jagang's forces to sweep up on us from the south. General Meifert says we will have to leave sufficient forces here to guard the passes while the bulk of our army heads south to meet the invaders. We have no choice. With half of Jagang's force to the north, on the other side of the passes, and half heading down to go around the mountains and come up from the south, that leaves the People's Palace right in the middle. Jagang is no doubt licking his chops over such a prospect. And I'm afraid I don't have much time. The entire camp is in an uproar. We only just learned the news that Jagang has split his army, and we are rushing to strike camp and start south. I must also divide up the sisters. So many have been lost that there are not many left to divide. At times I feel as if we are in a contest with Jagang to see who will be the last one with a sister left. I fear what will happen to all these good people if none of us survive. If not for that, I would be satisfied to leave this world behind and join Warren in the spirit world. General Meifert says that we can't spare a moment and must be on our way at first light. I will be up the entire night with the arrangements, seeing to it that we have sufficient men and sisters here to defend each of the passes and inspecting the shields to make sure they are sound. If the Order's Northern Army were to break through up here, it would be a much quicker death for us. Unless you have something important that must be discussed right now, I'm afraid that I must go. Anne covered her mouth with her hand as she read. The news certainly was disheartening. She wrote an immediate reply so as not to inconvenience Verna. No, my dear, nothing important just now. You know that you are in my heart always. A message came back almost immediately. The passes are narrow, so we have been successful at defending them. The Imperial Order can't use their overwhelming power in such narrow places. I feel confident the passes will hold. Since Jagang is stymied by not having been able to cross the mountains, this buys us time, while he is forced to take an army all the way south and then back up into Dahara, now that he has the weather to his advantage. Since this is the greatest danger and threat, I will be heading south with the army. Pray for us. We will eventually be forced to meet Jagang's horde in the open plains where he has the room to throw the full weight of his forces against us. I am afraid that unless something changes, we will have no chance to survive such a battle. I can only hope that Richard fulfills prophecy before we are all dead. Anne swallowed before answering. Verna, you have my word that I will do what I must to see to it. Know that Nathan and I will be dedicated to the task of seeing prophecy fulfilled. Perhaps no one but you would truly understand that this is what I have devoted myself to for over half a millennium. I will not abandon my cause. I will do whatever I can to see that Richard does what only he can. May the Creator be with you and all our brave defenders. You will all be in my prayers every day. Have faith in the Creator, Verna. You are prelate now. Give that faith to all of those with you. In a moment, a message began appearing. Thank you, Anne. I will check my journey book every night as we travel to see if you have any news of Richard. I miss you. I hope we can be together again in this life. Anne carefully wrote her last reply. Me too, child. Fair journey. 
Anne leaned on her elbows and rubbed her temples. This was not good news. But it was not all bad. Jagang had wanted to break through the passes and end it swiftly, but the passes held, and he had finally been forced to split his army and begin a long, grueling march. She tried to look at the bright side. They still had time. There were any number of things they could still try. They would think of something. Richard would think of something. Prophecy had promised that he held within him the chance for their salvation. She couldn't allow herself to believe that evil would darken the world. A knock on the door made her jump. She pressed her hand over her racing heart. Her Han hadn't warned her that someone was about. Yes? Anne, it's me, Jensen, came the muffled voice from the other side of the door. Anne replaced the stylus and tucked the journey book in her belt as she slid her chair back. She smoothed her skirts and took a deep breath to try to slow her heart back to normal. Come in, dear, she said as she opened the door, smiling at Richard's sister. Thank you for the plate of food. She held an arm back toward the table. Would you like to share it with me? Jensen shook her head. No, thank you. Her face, framed by red ringlets, was a picture of concern. Anne, Nathan sent me. He wants you. He was quite urgent about it. You know how Nathan gets. You know how his eyes get all big and round when he's excited about something. Yes, Anne drawled. He does tend to get that way when he's digging up mischief. Jensen blinked, looking a little startled. I fear you may be right. He told me in no uncertain terms to come get you and bring you there straight away. Nathan always expects people to squeak when he pinches. Anne gestured for the young woman to lead the way. I guess I'd best see to it. Where is the prophet then? Jensen held her lantern up to light her way as she started out of the little room. He's at a graveyard. Anne caught the sleeve of Jensen's dress. A graveyard? And he wants me to come to this graveyard? Jensen looked back over her shoulder and nodded. What is he doing in a graveyard? Jensen swallowed. When I asked him that, he said he was digging up the dead. Chapter 10 In a broad, weeping willow growing on the grassy slope leading down to the graveyard, a mockingbird was spending its night repeating a variety of strident calls meant to defend its territory against interlopers. Ordinarily, a mockingbird's calls, although intended as threats to others of its kind, to Anne's ear could be quite lovely. But in the dead still quiet of night, such piercing whistles, chatters, and whoops were jarring to her nerves. She could hear another mockingbird in the distance making similar threats. Even the birds couldn't achieve peace. Plowing through the long, wild grasses, Jensen pointed as she held the lantern up with her other hand so that Anne could see her way. Tom said that we would find him down there. Sweating from the long hike, Anne peered down into the darkness. She couldn't imagine what the prophet was up to. In all the time that she had known the man, he had never done such a strange thing. He had done any number of strange things, to be sure, but this just wasn't one of them. As old as he was, one would think that he would want to avoid spending time in a graveyard any sooner than he had to. Anne followed Richard's younger sister as she started down the hill, trying to keep up without running. It seemed like they had already walked half the night and she was winded. Anne hadn't known of this graveyard, all but forgotten out in a distant, uninhabited expanse of wilderness. She wished that she had thought to bring along some of the food sitting on the plate back in her room. Are you sure Tom is still down here? Jensen looked back over her shoulder. He should be. Nathan wanted him to stand guard. For what, to fight off the other body snatchers? I don't know, maybe, Jensen said, without so much as a hint of a giggle. Anne wasn't very good at making people laugh. She was good at making their knees tremble, but she just wasn't all that good at jokes. She guessed that a graveyard on a dark night wasn't a good place for jokes. It certainly was a good place to make the knees tremble. Maybe Nathan just wanted company, Anne suggested. I don't think that was it. Jensen found a fallen section in the split rail fence that surrounded the place of the dead and stepped over it. 
Nathan asked me to bring you out here, and he wanted Tom to stay and stand guard over the graveyard. I think to make sure there was no one around that he didn't know about. Nathan liked being in charge. Anne guessed that being a gifted Rawl, he could do no less. It was always possible that the whole thing was a pretense just to get Jensen, Tom, and Anne to run around doing his bidding. The prophet was given to a sense of drama, and a graveyard did tend to set a mood. Actually, right then, Anne would have been happy were it nothing more than some idiosyncratic diversion of Nathan's. Unfortunately, she had the queasy feeling that it was something not at all so simple or so innocuous as a bit of theatrics. In all the centuries she had known him, Nathan had at times been secretive, deceptive, and occasionally dangerous, but never to evil ends, although that hadn't always been apparent at the time. During most of his captivity at the Palace of the Prophets, he had tried the sisters' patience until they were ready to scream and tear out their hair. Yet he wasn't maliciously willful or contemptuous of good people. He had an abiding hatred of tyranny and an almost childlike glee about life. No matter how exasperating the man could be at times, and he could be exasperating in the extreme, Nathan had a good heart. Almost since the beginning, despite the circumstances, he had been Anne's confidant and ally against the Keeper getting a foothold in the world of life and against evil people having their way over the innocent. He had worked hard to help stop Jagang. He had, after all, been the one to first show her a prophecy about Richard 500 years before he would be born. Anne found herself wishing that it wasn't dark and that they weren't in a graveyard and that Jensen didn't have such long legs. It suddenly occurred to Anne why Nathan would need Tom to stand guard and make sure no one was around that they didn't know about, as Jensen had put it. Just like Jensen, the people in Bandakar were pristinely ungifted. They were devoid of that infinitesimal spark of the Creator's gift carried by everyone else in the world. That essential connection made everyone else subject to the reality and nature of magic, but for these people, magic did not exist. The absence of such an inherent elemental nucleus of the gift not only made the pristinely ungifted immune to magic, but since they could not interact with what to them did not exist, it also made them invisible to the power of the gift. If even one parent possessed the pristinely ungifted trait, then it was always passed on to the offspring. These people had originally been banished to preserve the gift in mankind's nature. It had been a terrible solution, to be sure, but as a result, the gift had survived in the human race. Had such a solution not been undertaken, magic would long ago have ceased to exist. Because prophecy was magic, it too was blind to these people, no book of prophecy had ever had anything at all to say about the pristinely ungifted or about the future of mankind and magic now that Richard had discovered these people and ended the banishment. What would happen now was completely unknown. Anne supposed that Richard would have it no other way. He did not exactly enthusiastically embrace prophecy. Despite what prophecy had to say about him, Richard by and large discounted it. He believed in free will. He took a dim view of the notion that there were things about himself that were predestined. In all things in life, and in magic especially, there had to be balance. In a way, Richard's acts of free will were the balance to prophecy. He was the center of a vortex of forces. With Richard, prophecy was attempting to predict the unpredictable. And yet, it had to. Most troubling was that Richard's free will made him a wild card in prophecy, even those prophecies in which he was the subject. He was chaos among patterns, disorder among organization, and as capricious as lightning. And yet he was guided by truth and driven by reason, not whim or chance, nor was he arbitrary. That he could be chaos among prophecy and at the same time be completely rational was an enigma to her. Anne worried greatly about Richard because such contradictory aspects of the gifted were occasionally a prelude to delusional behavior. The last thing they would want 
was a leader who was delusional. But all of that was academic. The central problem was that while there was still time, they had to find some way to make sure he took up the cause fated to him in the prophecies and to fulfill his destiny. If they failed, if he failed, then all was lost. Verna's message sat like the shadow of death in the back of Anne's mind. Having spotted their light, Tom appeared out of the darkness, sprinting through the long grass to meet them. There you are, he said to Anne. Nathan will be happy that you're finally here. Come on and I'll show you the way. By the brief glimpse she got in the weak yellow light from the lantern, Tom's face looked troubled. The big Daharan led them deeper into the graveyard, where in areas there were rows of gently mounded graves outlined in stones. These had to be newer, because most of what Anne could see was nothing but tall grass that over time covered over stone and the graves they marked. In one area, there were a few small granite gravestones. They were so weathered, it could only be that they were ancient. Some of the graves were marked with simple boards with names carved in them. Most such markers had long ago turned to dust, leaving much of the graveyard looking like nothing more than a grassy field. <laughs>